Legendaries, and welcome to episode 115 of RPG Digest. In this live stream formatted podcast, we provide deep dives, fundamentals, and overviews. Nope, all that's gone today. Today we are doing an interview. No, nope, a conversation. I hate that word interview. It sounds so professional. If there's one thing I'm not. It sounds that's... antagonistic. It sounds antagonistic. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> We're gonna have a great conversation today, I think. Uh, I am. Why does it still say the RPG authority on here? I still haven't removed that <laughs> nonsense. John Maxley Oshlo, your favorite curmudgeon critic and judge, along with me as usual, is the man who can translate anime into English for me. That's right. This is dubbed, not subbed. <laughs> Ethan Dog, Chris, sir. How are you today, sir? I am doing well. I hope everyone is doing just as. And uh, as we go through the proclivities here, talking about our monetary backers, uh, yeah, you made me feel guilty about like I was going to talk about these. So I'm just going to click on the side where you're, you're telling us how your week okay. was. Thank you for all the subscribers. The, uh, you have made this possible. What's about to happen here? And no, don't be scared. It's a good touch. <laughs> and if you want to see us, uh, you should be watching us right now. Obviously, it's Sunday or Friday for the for the Friday night chill stream. Or you can watch uh, Thursday or Saturday and. Uh, We'll, you'll be seeing a whole bunch of people playing co-op games and failing miserably. And there is the charity. Now we we've, we've already given enough of this charity. Why are you doing this? Now it's 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 Heathen Dog's time. It was the Wounded Warriors time before we finished that. Heathen Dog now it's just Heathen angry Dog because time. he's not getting crafty money anymore. Crafty, stop paying us. Stop tithing. Damn it. <laughs> And finally, we believe that role-playing games should take place in fantastic worlds, and the focus of your tabletop group should be on role-playing and having a great time. Is my voice cracking? Yeah, it is. That's kind of... Cha-cha changes! <laughs> the core values are RPG, and any good tabletop community are escapism, not representation. I cannot talk. Escapism, nope. not representation. Entertainment over activism and natural, organic inclusion, not forced diversity. And what do we have going on today? I'm not even going to ask you about your week, and I'm not even going to tell you about mine. I'm just awesome. going to throw everything a shoe. That's right. I'm using the word a shoe. I'm just going to throw it all to the wind. And today, if you want to bring him in while I'm talking about this, we have our special guest, Mark McKinnon of Discotomy Publishing uh, Corporation. Uh oh. Yeah, Corporation. <laughs> you think I'd have that written down? Uh, but I didn't because do I'm. Notes you don't have with you. Oh, it definitely was. So. <laughs> yes, Crafty, we know. We we absolutely appreciate it, Crafty. Uh, a couple of notes before we say hello to him. Uh, number one, uh, Super Chats. We will read your Super Chats at the appropriate time. So I'm not going to cut him off to read uh, Super Chats. Also, I am not going to, uh, just like we did with Kevin and Sean and Grim and everybody else, I am not going to read off anything that's overtly disrespectful, unless it's about me and Heathen Dog. I don't care about that. But uh, so, yeah. All right. That's enough of that nonsense. There we go. There and again, go away, Heathen Dog. That's my natural <laughs> position. <laughs> well, on top. You've been kicked out today, <laughs> sir. Thank, thank you very much, Crafty, though, and Hunger. Uh, appreciate the donations. All right. So we have Mr. Mark McKinnon on. Keeps yelling at me for calling him Mr. It's just an old Minnesota habit of mine. <laughs> and uh, how are you doing today, sir? Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and so forth, and then we'll jump into the fun. Yeah, things are good. Thanks very much for having me on, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mark McKinnon. So I'm the owner of Discami Publishing Company. Uh, and I do other things on the side, but uh, I had an eight-year political life. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't get re-elected elected in the last election. That just uh, recently happened. So eight years as a counselor. And so that was a, a good time that I did that. But now I'm jumping in and doing more of the publishing company, 
So we do mainly anime role playing, but we've done in the past some tabletop games, uh, usually anime related, of course, but uh, we have a number of different lines. We also do a superhero role playing line and a couple of other diverse uh, micro game lines. So I, I lived in Japan for a while. And one of the things that I found interesting from an American perspective is that uh, they actually advertise the Japanese self-defense forces through anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you, you'll go through and you'll see this picture, like join the self defense forces, and it'll be you know an anime soldier, wow. look like something at Gundam or something. Like, uh, what is that? I asked my wife. Well, not my wife at that time, but uh, like, hey, what's what's that? It's that. She's like, oh, that's uh, it's advertising for self defense forces. Like, really? So I got to ask: When you're a counselor, did you change Canada into promoting everything through anime? No, that would have been a lot better. Uh, I think a lot of things. No, it's, uh, you know, in the end, they were quite separate jobs. And I, although it would be great to be able to use my counselor platform to promote my company, I made sure that we kept things nice and separate. Oh, awesome. yeah. well, that's, that, that's why your company's not bigger, because to, to succeed in business, you have to cheat, lie, and steal. Um, <laughs> see, no, no one, no one hey, taught you that in that part of business school. He's from Canada. They don't know how to do that. They do. I've met Drake. <laughs> so well, one of the things I do want to do want to mention here is that uh, a lot of people might not know this, but you've actually been on our show once before. This is yeah. back when I was still living in Germany. And I, I will tell you that I learned a couple of lessons from you being on the show. And they're all good lessons. All good lessons. Wow. He doesn't learn um, anything from me. I got to hear this. Uh, well, <laughs> I just ignore you. See? Uh, the, the first lesson was, so if we were talking about big eye, small mouth, going mm -hmm. through it. And my whole reason for going through that is I'm not an anime guy. That's yeah. all him. I just, I, it never it's interested like it. me. It's, it, it's just, it just hasn't. I mean, it's not that it's bad. It's just, it's never interested me, right? Mm. But I'm like, hmm, we don't have the old show that we had. I know he likes anime. He likes to talk about role-playing games. Let's mix the two. And I found Big Eye Small Mouth. I said, this looks pretty awesome. Let's, you know, I think I can, uh, I can sit through this. <laughs> so that was my mentality then. And we we're going through it. And one of the big things was convince me that, that, that just any role-playing game can't be an anime role-playing game. Well, that was one thing you actually convinced me of. Like, actually, if I'm going to play an anime game, yeah, why wouldn't I use best one? Because I was saying before I could use D&D &D 5e. I could, I could I just draw spiky hair on anybody and I, it's an anime game. Uh, no, you actually convinced me without even being, that was before you're on. We learned about your passion for your product, which is something that I always appreciate. I, I, I you know, love or hate us for some people out there. Uh, we're passionate and I like it when other people have that kind of passion as well. And when you came on, I wouldn't say to defend your products. I don't think we were dogging it, but we were making some, we'll say some mistakes, some observational mm -hmm. mistakes. Uh, you came on and you pointed those pop, pop, pop right out. And we're like, okay. And, and, the they, I, and you weren't you weren't condescending or mean about it, which was awesome. No, I mean, uh, really it's not my style. Uh, I do really like I do like uh, making sure that we're you know accurate, and I'm a big facts mm -hmm. guy, and I have a, a very strong uh, scientific background, and so. Yeah, it's fine to have disagreements and it's fine to, to like certain things and not like other things for different reasons. But let's just make sure that everyone is doing it from from the right reasons. Well, you educated me on the whole because we we I, i'm not going to say i still sit here and like okay i'm totally convinced but we didn't like what was it that we didn't like how the word attributes was used i remember right. that yeah yeah and you're like well you know D, D use attributes or use ability scores not attributes and i'm thinking in my head nope i've used the word <laughs> attribute my entire life since the 80s since i was playing the game uh i went and looked it up and i yep. didn't have to look far because as you can no, see i got a couple of books right behind there, yeah. me and and there it's was ability like, scores. Yeah, oh. uh, we we got that a lot. Even when we we first came out with the game back, uh, you know, quite a long time ago, people were saying, you know, why are you using attributes? That's what D and D uses. Like, no, they use ability scores. I I th I blame him. Well, actually, I blame people before him, but I blame him because he's a big Palladium guy, and I, that's where mm -hmm. I kind of got my start. I technically played D and D first, but I played more Palladium, and what Palladium calls it attributes. I think that just stuck with me. I don't mm -hmm. know. Anyway, but we appreciated you being on. Then you were absolutely fantastic. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, I, I think you were there, our first actual guest for RPG Digest that popped in, even if it was unscheduled. So uh, I, I was happy to reach out to you and, and uh, give you this time to talk about your Kickstarter, which we'll do in a little bit, and bring you back on. Heathen Dog, any words that you've got before we actually get into really letting him talk finally? Well, no. Okay, there we go. 
<laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you, have, you haven't said anything yet. We, we haven't gone into the new stuff yet. I want to I want to see the new stuff. And then I want to have opinions and I want to have opinions about my opinions. And then I want to say stuff and then he's going to correct me. And then I'm going to go, no, you're wrong. And then he's going to be right. But I'm still going to say he's wrong. And then we're going to end the show. It's going to be great. And then he'll send me a discord message. I was wrong. Just don't who's tell that, anybody. Who's that butthead? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's, we'll start off with, I think, probably the most important thing. How are you doing? Because this whole thing was precipitated by the need oh, for yes, surgery sir. and so forth. So yeah. how are you doing? Uh, really well. I got like 95% of my motion back. Previously, I could awesome. move it like, you know, about five inches away from my body. And now I much better range of motion. It was uh, an expensive procedure, but one that was absolutely life changing at the time. I mean, of course, it would have been better if I didn't have to have it at all. But uh, given where I was looking at one to three years of just waiting until it got better, that just wasn't a feasible option. So uh, you, you, with some generous community support, you and your your crew uh, and your supporters really helped out, which, which was great. Uh, of course, you know, I didn't expect to, to raise the whole amount so dig into a little bit of savings but to get it done and it's uh money i we rarely spend money on on a lot of health care i mean yes pharmacy we do uh in canada you, you often got to pay for your drugs but uh medical procedures is not that common and uh, but it was really great and after it's been about three months now and so it's been a journey to you know keep stretching uh, but now that i'm getting back into the gym doing a little bit more exercising you know getting some of that strength back as well as the range of motion uh, it's life changing because now i can get back to work and actually actually think and i can do something other than just waiting to pop the next pain killer i don't know heathen dog's probably going to disagree with you on the pain pill thing but i'm with well, you on no that no one. i mean you, you, you... <laughs> I, I respect someone who, who had to take painkillers, you know, all the time and, and, and dodge the, the opiate bullet on that one at the end. That's good. <laughs> Not, yeah, I would have. That. I would have. I, I would have loved to have some opium. I mean, by the end, before I had the procedure, uh, just waiting, I was like, you know, do I go downtown Guelph and just go to the end of the street corner and just see if I can find something heavier? Because it was it was intolerable. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, I, I do not know how people survive like this. It was so bad, and you know, I had that light at the end of the tunnel. I knew that the procedure was coming, and so that kind of kept me going. But it completely changed my understanding of what uh, uh, long term pain that that you know, never yeah, ending exactly like, ceasing yeah. pain is like, I had no clue what that could be like. And now that I realize it's like, wow, there's some people out there that are really in a lot of trouble. And that's why the, the opiate crisis is so big. We saw it as, as a politician in, in, in our city, obviously, you know, as, as most uh, governments are experiencing that. So I got to see why some of the, the draw towards the opiates would be. Yeah. I mean, Ooh. it wouldn't be addictive if, if it was all bad up front. Hmm. No. <laughs> things that suck from the get-go usually people don't get addicted to this this is kind of a message for some folks out there i'm speaking for myself and myself only not for heathen dog or for mark here uh, i know people feel ways and things about legion of myth because of some of our videos and how we do things but this is an, a perfect example to me of when when somebody's awesome and i mean that when somebody's awesome when you came on the show you talked to us schooled us you're respectful about it you know we we learned some things and so forth uh, from that moment forward i wanted you to come back at some point even if i you know i'm not running around uh playing bessem every day of the week or so forth i, I like your products I, I like the passion that you put into it and because of that when i when i saw the kickstarter absolutely no i wouldn't want something like that to happen to somebody you or anybody else but uh, when i saw that it's like hey we've got to help out somehow i mean he came on the show <laughs> It was awesome for us. So uh, let's do that. Because people have asked, like, I don't hear you talking about Bassem. I, I didn't even know you knew anything about this. Uh, but absolutely. I mean, that that's one of those areas where it's like, if we can help out somebody that, that we appreciate, I don't see why we wouldn't do it. So I was happy to have done the little part that we did. And I know you got a lot more on the side than, than what we donated. But, you know, just to shine a little light on that, I, I think that I'd do it again. So Well, it, and it was extremely kind because I'm just eating you. You guys don't know me that well. We're not we're not friends. We don't hang out. We don't have this long history. And yeah, we've had some some great connections on the show. But to go that far and to have your your community supporters um, support as much as they did, uh, it's really it was it was incredibly humbling because uh, I know that there are a lot of people that need 
you know, like Indiegogo's and, and GoFundMe's in the States because of the medical situation as a Canadian is typically doesn't happen that often. And to have to, or, or maybe not to have to, but to want to reach out because any, any amount of support would just take a little bit of burden off the family and, and, mm-hmm. and off me, obviously. Uh, and yeah, I could have paid the whole thing by myself if need be, and it just would have hurt a little bit more. And, but to have that, that sort of support from people that saw another human needing help and stepped up, that was incredibly touching to me. So, I mean, I can't thank you, your, your crew enough for, for helping out. And what, what really got us going is that uh, you didn't just ask for free money. Yeah, you know, that, that was really important for to me. Free money because the, the respect level will go down at that point. I mean, we probably still would have done it, Max. We probably, yeah, we, we, we still would have done it. It's my chill stream. I would have done it anyway. Yeah, yes, you would have done it anyway. You would have done it anyway. But uh, the the fact that, hey, I need extra money and by and to do this, I'm going to give you extra stuff. Like, oh, that sounds like a deal. By the way, I'm <laughs> okay. already starting to wrap up. I'm, I'm missing three mailers. So I have to wait till I get three more mailers, but I'm already starting to wrap up the, 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 we have our winners, which we'll announce later That's awesome. um, for, for all the goodness. I was hoping to hoard it myself, but no, I have to give it away, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's because the community donated uh, that money. A bunch of people told me, I don't know how true this is, uh, but a bunch of people said that they're not going to give money to Kickstarter. They refuse, you know, political reasons, whatever, mm-hmm. but bought stuff directly from Discami uh, on their own. I know one of them is, uh, said it directly to me multiple times so that there are a few others who told me that they're going to buy stuff directly from just Kami because of the giveaway so i don't know what that totaled I, I don't care it's not about money for me it's about uh honestly it's about hey we helped out i'm glad we could and you know one day we'll be big enough maybe we can do more <laughs> all right so wait but before we we go on and and mark 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 tells us about what this kickstarter was about and uh, and all that new products and stuff, and and we we go and we t- we give all the winners to the giveaway and stuff like that. Let's let's look at some chat. I mean, I have a couple starred. I was yeah. gonna, uh, we have let's go back up to the super chat because we do have a super chat. Yes, we do. Hung out of the star. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for five dollars. I miss my maxi poo. Hey, boo. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Uh, Hungar is great. If you have not followed his channel, go ahead and follow Hungar the Starvarian. Most of you already probably know this, but he is the brother of DM James. Uh, I don't know what name DM James is going by this week. We'll just say DM James. You can find him there. But uh, great channels. Check them both out. Uh, good, good people. Um, oh wait, I got one. I got one. Okay. Oh, Crafty you. Matt has backed the latest books. Thank you, thank you, Crafty. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh... I have a couple start for questions, but I'll let you, you get do. to yours first. You do. Um, no, Mr. Max, you're not going to need your programmer socks for this. This is not going to be needed. And uh, we got a question from Mark here. It's one of the star ones. I'll let Max take that one. So a question yeah. for Max for later. Can you Mark. talk? And and I, uh, oh, sorry, you're right. Did I say Max? <laughs> question from Mark. I told you I can't talk today. Uh, from Mark for later. Can he talk about lit RPG being offered? And for us old guys, what is a lit RPG? I was going to get into that when we go through the Kickstarter itself. So do you want to talk about that uh, now, Mark? Or when we actually go through the Kickstarter oh, and look yeah, at Yeah, we could, we could do it later. That, that's fine. I'll. Uh, okay. It's a great question and something I'd love to answer. All right, I will keep that one start. And then we'll go down to this one. Ellis's question mark is a former politician would say this game would meet the needs, interests of, okay. Never mind. Stop it. I I just saw a question. Yeah. And then at the uh, end, he said, not a real question. Front load that one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Front load that one. Because I have to go. Yeah. By the way, our chat can get weird. We allow it. I just don't want to be disrespectful to you. But let me get this up on the screen here. Uh, Best of multiverse share. I am sharing the audio, folks. I'm sharing. Don't yell at me if you don't hear it this time. <laughs> there we go. Um. Uh, So here we go. Do you mind if we take the minute and a half to play the video? Yeah, no, go ahead. All right, guys, this is for everybody out there. Now, I know I've been kind of posting this on our Discord. A lot of you have probably already backed, but in case you haven't, I would like to see this number go up. Let's let's see how many folks we can get to back this product. Thank <laughs> you. 
Right. Epic music there. It was. And uh, so first question I have for you with regard to this as we go down, let me zoom in on this so people can actually read it, is uh, is this just an expansion of the six core settings that are found in the best wait, seven in the best book? Or is this uh, uh, is this going to add new ones? Yeah. So this is a setting book of the primary worlds of the multiverse. That's what it primarily is, uh, you know, to use a, a bit of a pun. So there are six. Earth is the seventh, but Earth has some problems right now. And you don't even need to have a, uh, you know, a full big chapter on Earth, given that we know what Earth is. But it divides up the six different worlds into their own chapter, each roughly twelve to 15,000 words that goes into them. We do talk a little bit about other worlds kind of beyond the, the initial prime worlds that are connected. The way the multiverse is set up is it's a cosmic web where you kind of have a hub of, of your, your six prime worlds plus Earth. And then outside on the next shell are the inner worlds. And then outside on the next shell are the outer worlds. And then you got the beyonders uh, outside there. And then off off of Earth, you have parallel worlds. But this one is mainly focused on going into a lot more detail on the six world, because each of the, the six worlds represents a different genre you can play in, whether Bazaroth is demonic horror, you got Aradia, which is romantic fantasy, you got your high fantasy with uh, Icarus. And so the different worlds are different genres as well, which allows us to kind of show the genre through the context of a world. And would you say the Beyonder realms those would be the ones kind of like homebrew settings yeah they could be and they could be virtually infinite in terms of what the beyonders are the idea uh, of the the multiverse is that every single world can exist in some way uh, and it just comes down to what you want so the beyonders could be something a little bit stranger if you were kind of going really far out of the kind of what we're presenting but you can also have a homebrew world like that's what in some ways eurasia the Grave of Heaven, which is one of the source books that we're offering. So this is a an inner world that is connected to one of the prime worlds, but that connection only plays if you're kind of playing within the multiverse itself and mm -hmm. kind of hopping between dimensions. Otherwise, that's just a, an irreverent fantasy world by itself, and we call that an inner world. We don't define every inner world and every outer world, and then, of course, we don't really define many of the beyonders at all. So people can take uh, their own spin and what they think that they, they maybe they have a homebrew campaign and they want that to be an inner world or that to be an outer world we give the the six prime worlds which we think is is kind of important to set up but if someone wants to swap them out and put their own world as a prime world and take out one of the ones we provide that's totally fine too one of okay, the things so i loved on. about go ahead hang on uh this this whole cosmic web thing i i i want to see if i have my have my uh head wrapped around it all right so you have you have the six prime worlds and earth now, all of these prime worlds, if you use the this uh, this multiverse book, they all have portals or ways to get to one another. Except except one. Usually that there's one that's usually missing. So, for example, uh, Aradia and Bazaroth are kind of like the romantic okay, fantasy, okay. They're, angelic they're and like demonic. diametrically opposed worlds. Yes, yeah, so not. they don't have way lines. Correct. But most of the prime okay. worlds have a way line to Earth and every other prime world. Okay, got it, got it. And then the, the inner worlds can, can be accessed from one or is it possibly more but definitely not all of the prime worlds so the mythology that we've set up is every prime world is connected to two inner worlds through a way line and so there's two inner worlds for every single prime world and okay there and usually the wouldn't only be way, the only way to get to these inner worlds is to go through that prime world is that correct 
If you're using the way lines, like that's one of the yep. ways to travel if you're using a portal. If someone has an ability to just walk through dimensions and doesn't use the portals, then they can, you know, if they decide in their cosmology that's how they travel, then they can just walk between any world. So that would be something. But the, that, the, the whole web is built upon these way lines. That's the, right. The that's that's using, the, using, the cosmic okay. web are the way lines. All right. So like, uh, for example, off of the high fantasy world, there is an inner world where, uh, where, uh, uh, let's just say it's it's a uh, it's a, a low low mag it's it's the same thing but very very low magic magic does exist but it's very very low this is an inner world connected to the high fantasy world if you are on the uh if you are on earth you have to portal to the the the, the, pri the prime world the high fantasy prime world and then wayline to right. this to this inner world so you you can't skip unless unless you have hacks abilities like you know open right. yeah, that, wherever. that's correct so something there, there's okay. a power we have called dimension walking which uh is very similar we got that inspiration from the amber uh novel system there you go uh, yeah, my my son, amber uh, and so yeah, I, so that's the dimension walking if you want to walk between them but if you want to use the the cos cosmology that we have for the, the 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 web system then yes you go from earth to Akaris, from Akaris to Eurasia, and from Eurasia, which is an inner world, you could maybe connect to several Beyonders, and you can go through them. So this allows people to to travel between the different dimensions, but they have to use the correct portal gates, which the highways, the basically. Highways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, have, you have to use the interstates. Got it. Right. I'm kind of mad that I went in and read all this in Bessem yesterday because you guys just explained it to me, and I didn't add it. To... <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Good. Good. It's a good now, question. Uh, uh, one why I and that brings another question. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it really does be, be, because if if you have to follow the way lines, that means you have to be possibly an obviously alien creature. And by the, I don't I don't mean like oh you have two heads or something in this one headed world, which is possible I suppose. But uh, what I mean is if you're going from a high tech world and and you you want to go to an inner world that only attaches to the high fantasy world, you have to go through the high fantasy world with with your mechs and your and your power armor and stuff like that how how would a, a game master handle that how 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 could they handle that in in such a way that it won't be just obviously disruptive for everyone right and and first of all we don't expect most people to play in a multiverse style game we don't think most people are playing sliders uh for example uh with their anime games most people will will pick a genre they'll pick a world usually fantasy because it's certainly the most common for role playing and they'll just play in that world and that's completely fine there's no problem with doing that or they'll play on earth and just just stick there but but we've set up the cosmology to explain why there are different dimensions why you can get uh, mecca on earth for example or if you want to have you know the, you know we certainly always hear about if you're playing DD or something similar about you know the, the demon dimensions and summoning demons into the fantasy world well that's from a different plane of existence so we've sure. set up that you can travel between planes if you want to and in the worlds that we have and in, in the kind of the setting yeah there are some characters which are you know, from Bazaroth, but they're actually set up in one of the other worlds and they're messing around there. They're they're doing things that are good for them because they're trying to play the, the game of politics. And politics plays a lot within the prime worlds. It's not just you know, at, when you're at a high enough level, then a lot of it is going to be about how do you get your home world giving the best advantage? And we have it set up so that people can move between the dimensions. There's a structure that we have, which are called the, the key power. So there's keys and there's skeleton keys within the universe. So keys are people that are connected to a single dimensional gate. So one way line between, say, high fantasy and uh, let's just yeah. say uh, heavy weather. And that dimensional, there's a key that can do that. And then we have skeleton keys, which can open any gates and the, this again we've offered the cosmology so if players wanted to to say well i'm a dimensional traveler and i'm a skeleton key that can open all these gates that's great that's your power and that's what you do and that can kind of explain while you're bringing your mecha into your your demonic right. world for example yeah but but, how but no one has to play that, that. well no well, no, you, no, no, you, one has, right. no one has to but but you can so people will absolutely so uh <laughs> how how would how would you handle like like a high-tech characters passing through a high fantasy world or vice versa how 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 would you uh how would you help a game master in one or two hints navigate that to where it doesn't go off the rails 
Right. And and it comes down to two things. One, first of all, it's if you look at, at different anime, if you're an anime fan, you're playing Besom, there's lots of examples of anime where they have different influences. And so if you're looking at, well, how do I explain having demons come through to Earth? Well, watch Demon City Shinjuku or watch Tokyo Ghoul or watch any anime show where they kind of blend the two. But from a, a mechanical point of view, that's what the great thing about a point-based, effects-based system comes in. So unlike if you had, for example, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you want to throw mecha in the game. They don't really have a system to deal with damage to items and uh, you know fighting within a machine. That isn't part of the game structure. But in mm -hmm. Besom, with our point-based system where the same points are being used across dimensions, that if you have a character uh, you know, who is a demon and they're going into a high-tech world... Uh, how they they interact with their attacks and their abilities and attributes versus what someone in a high tech world uh, operates in it's point based so it's balanced and so there's no problems with the gm incorporating them all because we have the same foundational system across all genres okay so uh no, number one would be hey don't worry about interacting with with the people either in combat or out of combat because all of the all of the all of the effects all of the all of the damage all of the attacks all of the all of the uh you know coercions or whatever they're all using the same dice they're all you know, using the same system they all do the same damage you know i mean uh, if if you want to throw in special things because of force fields and magic or whatever that's on you but it it all it all works the, the same way whether you're firing a bullet or or or, or firing a, a little pew pew uh um, fire, fire magic. Bolt. Yeah. yeah and and all of that comes down to you know, with an effects based system, you will have say a weapon that does damage. Now, if you're on a high tech world, maybe it is a projectile that does damage. And maybe for fantasy, it's a flamethrower uh, that shoots magical fire versus mm -hmm. a, a beam weapon in a Star Wars style thing. That's that's sure. a blaster pistol. But in the end, the effect is damage. And if you right. have anything surrounding those effects, for example, if I hit you with this, you catch on fire, then that is how you build the weapon using the attribute system, which you would build it as something that maybe is contagious. So you hit someone, uh, they start on fire and they can get other people on fire. You can customize all of the weapons and attributes to give you the, the, the benefits that you want. But the effects-based system means that you were just giving you the game effect and then you determine the story effect. See, I feel like I'm being called out on this one indirectly by Heathen Dog because he knows what? he knows all of this. Back back when we played uh, Hero Heroes Are Champions, mm -hmm. yeah. I couldn't I could not wrap my head around. I don't, it's weird because I don't know how I didn't get it, but I didn't get it. I had to have my fireball be different than a bullet. And we were playing, you know, this is back in the day, we were playing champions and, and it's like, it's range killing attack. And I'm like, no, it's fire. Carthon and I were trying to explain to him, no, the range killing attack for fireball is the exact same mechanic as the range killing attack for a armor but piercing it's bullet. It's the same thing. <laughs> so, so it that, that, looks different. So, so and a lot uh, of it comes down to it's, it's the, it's the narrative effect. So Bessem is, is not about, uh, being incredibly realistic, being simulationist. That's not what it's about. Bessem is about giving you a system so that you can narrate a story. And mm -hmm. so having a very generic and simple understanding of what the effect of something is. So here's a weapon, it does damage. And then you can describe how it works in the game. And provided the description does give you other advantages. So if you say, well, I have a bullet, but it hits you and teleports you to another dimension. Well, that's a different effect. And yeah, so now you also have to pay for yeah. that effect. And exactly. so as long as you're you're paying for things in a point-based system, it doesn't matter if it's if it's fire or lasers or bullets. In the end, if it's just about the damage, then it's it's a unified effect. And that's why a multi-genre system, it was always designed, Bessem as a I always, you know, from book one back in 1997, it was a universal multi-genre system. And now we're actually making it a multi-genre game by adding the multi-genre setting. Okay. That's what that's one of the things that uh, I really do like about Bessem. And and to be fair, and you know, somebody might call it rude calling out a different game where we have you on, but uh, it's it's my background. It's like the hero system, or again, champions is just part of the hero system. Uh, a game like that is, and I find the math of creating characters. I don't want to say difficult, tedious. I think is the word in in strict point based games. 
But I'm glad I have people like Heathen Dog who absolutely get that and and walk and crunch through these things like there's crazy. So Heathen Dog, I want to make a character who's got a mecha who can do this and fire these things. Oh yeah, you do this point, do that point, do that point. It's like yes, and I and I love the fact because you can make anything and that was one of the things i actually tried to break besom a little bit when we were going over it was a year and a half ago i was like okay i'm gonna find something in here i can't make and with the one caveat being you have to have enough points to do it you can make everything my imagination was unfortunately not big enough to break Bessem. So, and and that's that's a strong point for folks out there. I, I think it's a strong point for the game and for folks who might want to get into a game like that. Uh, if if you can dream it, you can do it. And so, let's say you want to change. You know, we've been playing our fantasy game. Let's let's forget about the the the, the, the multiverse for just a moment. We're going to get back to the Kickstarter here in just a second. But uh, but you want to play your Dungeons and Dragons, right? You can make your Dungeons and Dragons character as you envision them. You know what? We're bored of this. Let's go play some Battletech. Boom. I'm, I've now got battle mechs walking, uh, stomping all over the landscape, shooting things up, and it's the same point system. It's the same 2D6 tri stats. You, you can do everything with it. I mean, it literally is a universal game, and this has come from somebody who tried to break it. Yep. And, and what, whenever we came out with the Absolute Power superhero game, that was showing people it's taking the Bessem system, which is what we call a tri-stat system. Yeah. And in many ways, it, it just kind of ups the power level. So when you're dealing with most characters in a Bessem style game in an anime uh, fantasy game or high tech, you might be in the 1 to 150, maybe as high as 200 points. 200 points for a Bessem character is, is pretty powerful. But when you're dealing with superheroes, you know, when, when you're trying to make sure that we have the appropriate Flash and Superman and Batman level, that we can get up to three, 350 uh, points. And I think one of the great things that having that unified system and having different applications that show you this is low level, this is higher level, is it gives you those ideas about, yeah, how do I make uh, switch over and have someone that's a, a super powerful mecha in a game where we're traditional a lot less powerful? Right. My last thing be before we go over some chat and uh, hopefully uh, what uh, get, give out uh, tell us tell people who won the the giveaway and stuff. Well, I want to get what the Kickstarter thing? back up after that. <laughs> okay, Kickstarter back up and then we're gonna get to that. But you brought up sliders. That was that was your go to in your head <laughs> thing about about uh, how uh, it's it's not like sliders. Well, what made you bring up sliders? I have a guess. Before you answer, I have a guess mm -hmm. because I have this problem in my head too. I believe Jerry O'Connell is a great actor, <laughs> but I can't prove it. Nothing he's been in has been good. Except well, sliders, sliders was good. Yeah, say sliders was good. <laughs> Except sliders. Now, is that your reasoning, or do you have another? No, nothing about Jerry O'Connell. Um, okay. It's it's actually it's you know first of all an age component. People who are twenty years younger than me might understand the reference, but um, you know the sliding between the dimensions is not the same as Stargate. Stargate's the other one. Often people go, oh, so it's like a Stargate. You go, this well, kind of, except um, a lot of it can. You know, when you say sliders, even the name sliding sliders, um, it kind of implies moving between things. So I just bring it up because people often understand that it's you're moving between dimensions that may not always be the same. Now that said, most sliders, of course, was earth-based and human-based. Yeah. And, you know, so it's not quite a perfect, but if we're trying to think of what actual anime show is, they're hopping between genres and different dimensions that are radically different genres. Well, it's, it's not common. And I don't think most people would play games where you're, you know, one session, you're Pokemon trainers in a in a human world, and then you're in a high tech fantasy world, and then you're in a reality punk world. I mean, I don't think that's going to be very common. But yeah, you break your that's yeah. yeah. So it's we're we're not running on a on a world where everyone's encouraged to jump between dimensions. But we have that as the foundational structure that explains all these different fantasy worlds. Pick it, pick a fantasy show uh, or an anime show that people want, and we wanted to set up a structure that explains why every single anime show exists in best simultaneously right it also explains how how uh one-off one-off uh extreme characters can happen like yeah. uh when when whenever a demon king comes around he's always from another dimension well he he's from he's from another prime world or right. or uh or an angel comes yeah. on well from another world you know the, these are one-off things that that arrive arrive in your world and now you can explain how it happened well it's it's from a, an inner or another prime attached to your world 
and yeah. he or she slid in using sliders slid in and uh and can't get back or you know it was it was a fluke or whatever don't doesn't know how to get back you know whatever but uh it, you you can explain uh overpowered or strange npc characters like that yeah very few dimensions yeah and yeah. you can decide to to play where all the characters are from their your world that you have and they don't know about any other dimensions yeah. or you can decide to, to up it into more of a political type structure and so you're playing characters that are about the politics of the cosmic web and you know you're you're with the movies and shakers you're trying to have meetings and set up different organizations that play within the cosmic web itself and that's a multiverse the, the book is designed to kind of encourage both styles of play you can either just play in our one sandbox or you can play across them all and you can you can play the game of thrones basically not okay. not, not the tv I show not, but the game of thrones is, is trying to see yeah. who's going to rule the multiverse i have not met many role players who like political drama i've Ooh. not met many right. all right now the the most i could see a, a player group getting getting really involved in is knowing that there are gateways to other worlds that are connected to our world and they are part of the police force or guardian force protecting mm -hmm. our world from incursion from other worlds and you can have a little bit of diplomacy you know back and forth with the leaders of other worlds but mostly your job is to is to defend the line you know this far no farther you're not allowed here you know and defend against incursion people will really get behind that most people get behind that rather than the game of thrones stuff well yeah, there, are I, two, I there are two big exceptions to that in my experience battletech players <laughs> love the politics of Battletech and the people who play high level domain play in Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, well, so we, the, the, we didn't play that way, but no, the vast no. majority of Grognards move. I mean, that's yes. why you have a game like Adventure Conquer King goes from adventuring to conquering to playing the domain play. That was, I mean, that wasn't our style, but there are a lot no. of people out there who do that. No, if if you are if you are from a tabletop strategy or one generation removed from tabletop tabletop strategy then I could see that, sure. But anything beyond that, if, if you were born in the 1980s or on, I don't see anyone sure. wanting to play, you know, su such a such a high-level political campaign. But it's there but if you want to. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not going to be popular, I, I would agree. However, uh, my influence comes from Amber, and Amber Diceless is all about the politics. There, and there for me, go. I love playing in that field. I mean, going on a good dungeon crawl is always great, of course, but I like playing in the game where you're you're playing to win, and not just to win a battle, but win the world. And mm -hmm. that level of pulp politicizing your rpg campaign a lot of it i had so much fun with with amber doing that where you were literally trying to to take over the entire multiverse uh and that's the style of play that is supported with Bessem. but i agree it's not going to be a common yeah. way to do it, that, it and i think most people are just going to stick in their existing genre and they're going to play their their anime show so i like black clover i'm going to play a black clover like game or i like sailor moon i'm going to play a sailor moon like game i expect most people are going to play there but we have the options if you want to go beyond that all right, do we All have right, any more chat? Hit, yeah, let's hit this chat then, because I want to get this kick. Talk about this Kickstarter. We got him on here to show his stuff, and we're not even letting him. Uh, all right. So the uh, oh no, we already asked that one. That one started for later. Okay. All right. What are Mark's top five anime? Oh, top geez. five. That's a tough one. I'd say number one, definitely Ranma, one half. Uh, my favorite anime of all time. And Sailor Moon is probably in the top five. You know, where, oh. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I love that. Um, I'd also say Core, uh, Kimigure Orange Road. Uh, it is is like Ranma one half without any, pretty well, any supernatural abilities. Mm. Yeah virtually it is straight up rom-com which is exactly the the type of show that i'm into um you know i honestly uh, i think probably princess mononoke it's not a tv show but uh as a movie yeah, fantastic a movie. Yeah. movie spectacular uh and then number five you know i've actually really been enjoying um slime that time i got reincarnated as slime it's a newer one <laughs> that and is most that of is a most good, of the shows show. i'm i'm into are a little bit older i i know uh you know i'm kind of a, a 90s anime fan it's not to say i don't like the current stuff but the, what's so great about slime is it's a great characterization of of the different people while still feeling a little bit more like a shonen you know male show it's not the relationship shows that I like with Sailor Moon and, and Ron Munn core, but it has this, this aspect to it. That is such a good exploration of high, high level fantasy when it comes to the slime himself. 
Well, yeah, it's, it's not only high level fantasy, but it also takes time to flesh out all of the supporting characters. Yeah. Where all of the supporting characters actually get a time to shine and then they are not reduced. They're kept at that level throughout the rest of the show. Other people are brought up, which is really great. And, and I am disappointed in you <laughs> that you did not bring up Assassination Classroom. Oh God, all. that's right. <laughs> because it was over two and a half years. I was I was reviewing anime. It was one of the only. I only gave out three five stars. Really, and that was one of them. I couldn't get past the first episode. You I honestly, I, ha I haven't honestly I haven't even seen it. I don't. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but that that's the thing about anime because I talked to my wife. My wife hates the anime that Americans watch. <laughs> like she's pretty much like. I, I should say Westerners in this case, but you know, that Westerners watch, it's like, she's like, you watch dumb anime, you watch, Oh, super Saiyan, blah, blah, blah. You know? Yeah. And then I'm, then I look at what she's watching. I'm like, you're literally just watching what we used to call cheers, except for now it's in an anime. Oh, yeah. now, now you're watching, uh, you know, just pick a show, right? Because yeah. anime is so diverse. It's got everything. Yeah. If you can imagine it, there's an, uh, there's an anime of it somewhere, yeah. even if it's not in English. Which is why we, we constantly get, I mean, since day one of doing Besso, it's always, how can you have an anime game? Anime is not a genre. Anime is a medium or a structure. And you can't have a game that represents every type of anime because Evangelion and Dragon Ball and, I don't know, some slice of life cooking show, they're not the same. And how do you run it under the same thing? And that's why we, you know, when it's we funny, talk last time, you I think it. there True are some general structures like that, that, yeah, I get that, is, that is representing some of the philosophies that are a little bit different than what we have here that you can kind of say, or maybe I'm a little more anime oriented, but in the end, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can try to make anything anime. It's just what's, what do you picture in your head? Really? That's, that's a lot yeah. of what's going to be anime is what do you see when you picture a dwarf? Do you see Gimli the dwarf? Uh, or do you see, you know, a, a dwarf from a particular show or do you see a dwarf from a comic book? I mean, it's, it's all of what you, you picture in your head and that's going to make the show, uh, you know, come through in, in your role playing. Okay. So, uh, what, what, what we, what we take away from this is, uh, you shouldn't, you need to watch that in the classroom. Okay. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> Uh, well, let's hit the super chat here real quickly. Weird guy, 564. Thank you for the $5, sir. Any game that involves transformable mecha gets a thumbs up from me. Cheers and drinks. I only drink when somebody says Earth Dawn. Not just, <laughs> not just transformable, but you can also have them combinable. So you can yes. do your Voltron style as well, where we specifically no, have merging. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, did you see the Rick and Morty? We got the Gotron. We got the Go Gotron. Yeah. We got the Go Go Gotron. <laughs> yes. I saw All right, it. let's 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 go through this because we've we've been talking about the multiverse. I, like I, I knew this was going to happen. We're not following the script, but that's fine. We're we're going to get some stuff about you in a little bit here. But we're here to to actually explain what's going on in this Kickstarter, and we've talked about the multiverse. Uh, to a small degree, and these books dive into it more. So as we're scrolling down here, look, I, I want to zoom in so people can see it, but uh, I also want people to be able to see uh, the book cover here. So you got the best of multiverse, and roughly, I, I don't, I don't care if you make a little mistake, it's okay. Uh, but roughly, what are the different pledge levels, and what can people expect from those pledge levels? As I'm kind of scrolling down, if you see anything on the screen you want me to stop at, just just tell me to stop, and I will. Yeah, well, the, the the big difference that we have with role playing that you often don't get with, of course, um, board game or miniature game uh, Kickstarters is we have PDFs and we have some pledge levels, which are you just get a PDF, whether it's of one one of the books, like just just pass a multiverse or multiverse plus Eurasia. Uh, so we have the PDF levels, but then we have the higher levels, which are you're getting the print version, you're getting the print and also the PDF for free. And so you basically your pledge levels, it's it's kind of like $50 for each of the two core books. So you have Bessem, which is, you know, Bessem multiverse, which is 50. Uh, and then you have Eurasia, which is 50. You can get a pledge that gives you both of them for 100. And then we have two other things that we're offering in the Kickstarter, which is a, a map pack of the six prime worlds. And these are, you know, two by three foot large wall maps that you'd have. And so if you throw that into your pledge, uh, then you're up to about 125. And then we also have the Ikarian Gate uh, novel, which is set within the Bessa multiverse, uh, within uh, some of the worlds there. And that's roughly a, a $25 book. And so, again, you 
can see as you add in, you could say, well, I want this book and this book and the novel and the maps. And then you're up to 150, 125, 150. And then we have an audiobook uh, of the novelization if you want. And now that'll bring up to 175. So we try to have tiers that are you know, easy to digest. So it's basically mm -hmm. 50, 100, 125, 150, 175, depending on what you're adding in. So I took uh, 150 out of Heathen Dog's money that I'd pay him, and I backed at that level. So, oh, that's uh, amazing! Thank you. <laughs> so th 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 thank Heathen Dog because he's not going to get paid that money. <laughs> so the only thing that the 150 doesn't come with is the audiobook. It comes with uh, everything else, uh, whether it's uh, the Bessa Multiverse, the Eurasia, the Map Pack, and the novel. All comes in for the for that price. So going back to Crafty's question, then up here. What is a lit RPG? Because you actually did explain it, and it was not what I thought it was. So uh, I'm I'm interested to hear what the folks in chat think about that. What what does this mean? So a lit RPG, it's it hasn't been around a long time in terms of that terminology, uh, and what people hear it, they might think of something else of, of what it is. But what is kind of accepted within the the lit RPG fandom, I guess, is you have characters who have RPG type stats in the book. And a lot of the focus of the book is about, the, or at least involves, increasing those stats. So, for example, if you had a lit RPG book where characters maybe, uh, which is very common in anime, they're, they're from Earth, and they either go into a computer game and get trapped there, or they die and get reincarnated in, uh, in another world that could be a computer simulation, but they all have RPG stats and they know they have stats. They might know then if it's an RPG based uh, kind of Dungeons and Dragons style, they might have levels and they're actually going to be leveling up. And so as the novel progresses, as the characters do stuff, they will gain levels uh, in something and they could have classes, they could have races uh, or it could be like Bessem where it's not a class or a level based okay. system, but they have points. And Point. so in the, in the game, or in the novel, the characters will have game stats and they will know they have game stats. Most of them are almost always from Earth or an Earth-like thing that they somehow get transported in. And then they can call up their character sheet and they look and say, oh, I just defeated this creature and I got X number of experience points and I'm going to increase my skills or I'm going to increase my fighting ability. This is something that the lit RPG aspect of it is the RPG version of the the characters has to play an important part in the literature game which is not the same as say the, the forgotten realms and the dragon lance books so those ones are not lady RPG. they they can be considered maybe a, a game fiction type where you're it's just a novel set within forgotten realms or set within dragon lance right but the characters don't have stats well in a lot of lit rpgs they can call up their stats they can talk to other characters about stats who if they're uh, from an isekai point of view, if they're if the main characters are transported into the world, they may think that they're playing a game and they're looking at stats where the characters who are native for that world might just know that they have stats and they can call up character levels and that. And to them, that's just normal part of life. But it's usually the, the fish out of water characters who are usually your main characters, which is why we call this a, an isekai lit RPG. So yep. the characters are kind of displaced out of their regular world into another world. And, right. And uh, and, and examples would be, say, Log Horizon, um, SAO, SAO, yeah. uh, Black Sorcerer, um, uh, reincarnated as a slime to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, and with those ones, the characters that, again, it's it's very common in uh, in anime to have isekai. So yeah. uh, isekai, when you're you know, in the anime, last 10 years, you're, you're going from really one common, world right. to another is is very common. But you know, when I think back on El Hazard as something that, you know, was out in the, the 90s, that when whenever they went to another world, they didn't have character stats. They were just in another world. So that's straight isekai. But mm -hmm. when you bring in the character stats and maybe they can call up their sheets and they can actually see, yeah, see an them overlay in, in their vision, that is a lit RPG at that point. Okay. All right. Understood. Come on, guys. Let's see if we can push this over 50K. How close are we? Uh, I got to scroll way up to get that. But uh, see if we can help push this over to 50K. It might not happen in the stream, but I think we can get there. You got, uh, was it two weeks left? Uh, two and a half now. So it's a, half, still okay. a fair amount of time. I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the pledges have been really strong. Awesome. And so I was showing the, uh, we call, uh, 
I was showing the, the stretch goals on there. It's only one stretch. So if you get past 50,000, are you going to add on any more stretch goals? Or do you think at that point oh, yeah. it becomes a little difficult and gratuitous? <laughs> no, we, we have uh, we, well, we have some ideas for stretch goals. We also listen to the community and we kind of get a feel by how the campaign's going and what some of the comments on the updates might be. But we only post one at a time simply because we want we want to you know keep the suspense going. And, and honestly, uh, on any campaign uh, that I run on Kickstarter, there is this middle point, which is slow. And it's, it's, it's almost all Kickstarters and you have to have something to talk about. And so these stretch goals are something that you can uh, at least bring in and for updates, because I think it's important when you're doing Kickstarter to engage with the community, uh, to, to keep them informed, to let them know that you're excited about what's happening. And so these stretch goals are something we, we only reveal one at a time when we did anime 5e, which was popping them off so incredibly quickly because it was massively popular. We usually, we posted about two at a time, you know, the, the next two were kind of hidden, but it, right now we're only doing one at a time. All right. Uh, we are going to come back to this because uh, I, I, we're not dropping the premise that this is for promoting the Kickstarter, uh, but I do want to change the, t uh, the tone of the conversation for just a moment here after I get the link out to everybody. It's in the description below folks, but I'm going to put this in chat for you as well. Kick. I can type. See, I can't speak or type today. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Uh, you can go ahead and back there. I highly suggest you do. Espe I'll punch my microphone, especially if you have uh, Bessem already. And if you don't, well, guess what? You can add that to the backer kick. You can add Bessem on there. Or you could win it from Legion. Oh, no, you can't. It's already been won. But I think that's a segue into finding out who won our good stuff here. And let's get that on the screen. Let's go show off and uh, congratulate the folks who won a little something, something here. I'm glad I actually did this the right way for once. Now, while, while he's doing that, if you don't know, we, we started this giveaway weeks ago. And you had you had to have you would you have won by now. And you know you're the winner because you were you were contacted for your either your email Shh, or your or, or your uh, or your address to ship all that stuff that's behind Max to to his left. Uh, is right now and now we're going to show everyone who won so everyone else can be jealous of the <laughs> so winners uh, because the one that's thing I part of the human condition and and for and we have to get all the hacks into chat because if somebody yeah. can't scream hacks or rigged then it isn't a real giveaway uh, one enough. of the things i do want to mention real quickly as i've had i did get a couple of complaints about the giveaway with, and, I, and i always seem to have to go through this sometimes folks just want to make it difficult <laughs> like I announced it, said it was on Discord, and said that you're going to have to respond. Those three things didn't always happen. I don't know what to tell you. Then I get a message later like, I don't use Discord. Okay, but the contest was on Discord. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you from there. That's like telling Mark, I don't use Kickstarter. And yes, I know there are people who don't use Kickstarter, who refuse to use Kickstarter. Well, that's on you. I get it. You know, you prefer Indiegogo or something else, whatever. In fact, some of the donations we think even came in that way. But ultimately, we had some rules. Most people followed them. Thank you very much. It was fun. And when I, I have graphics, I have screenshots of all the rolls, just in case somebody does actually legitimately get angry and scream hacks. But until then, uh, yeah, we called it the Scummy Giveaway. Congratulations to all the winners. And especially thank you to all of those who donated directly and indirectly to make this giveaway possible. And Mark, thank you to you for the nice haul that you sent uh, based on that. I, I don't even remember how much money. There you, I mean, yep. haven't even told you if you won or you. We're, we're sure. legitimate now. Yeah, Someone's already legit. said rig. But uh, yeah, I, I can't even remember how much uh, I sent you, but I know you sent a whole ton of stuff for us. Like I said, that's, that's me wrapping it up with a couple that still have uh, to go there. So thank you very much for uh, for donating that. Well, I'll call it donating that. It's just easier uh, just in order to give this away. And these folks are going to win some Tristat, some Sailor Moon, and some Bessem stuff that now this Kickstarter, they can just add to that collection. So who do we have first? I said, who do we have first? There we go. Our first giveaway, number one, was the Bessem 4E RPG core book. And that went to Mildra, who actually has a couple, at least one, but I think a couple of Bessem reviews on his channel. Nice. So uh, congratulations. You can uh, check that out. And Mildra cheated, by the way. How? Because his oh, name's going to come up a second time in a little the bit. the rig back up here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll just leave that rigged up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> then we had Anime 5e. Remember, these are the leatherette covers. It's better than the books I have. 
I should have just gave you my use. You should have just switched them out. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what the hell you were thinking, but whatever. <laughs> I know, right? No, no, no. And who won that one? We have Jade. Jade from uh, the ta uh, Table Breakers. Could call them Tabletop Group. From Table Breakers. He took over Gatekeepers from me. Thank God, because I didn't have time anymore. But uh, there you go, Jade. Jade's uh, going to get a copy of Anime 5E. And then we have the game that I spelled wrong because I didn't see the I in there and I couldn't go back and fix the graphic in time. <laughs> so we just called it Demon City when it's actually... You see that red eye? Anybody see that? I missed it. And uh, that's done on purpose. That 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 is a play on words with it because uh, the demonicity takes a lot of influence from uh, Demon City Shinjuku, which is an anime series and an RPG that we did. Uh, and so we when we did it with Demon City, we made sure that the I was kind of there. It's also I am in Demon City. That was also a little bit okay. of a pun that we did with it. So, yeah, I missed it, and uh, I had a problem with these graphics for some reason. Photoshop wouldn't save the file, so I couldn't yeah. go back and edit it. It said I had a font error or something, and it wouldn't let me save the file again. So I couldn't even fix it when I wanted to. But well, there we go. Mark, there that is that is actually a good uh, business lesson. If you want to get clever, you're going to leave people like Max behind. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's a lesson for me to be a little more attentive uh as somebody who's always got an eye for graphics yeah i, I completely missed that I was like hey so congratulations tcg joe and then we have pixies the role-playing adventures again these are tristat games so these are tristat box sets now i want to make sure i didn't lie to anybody mark i said that everything in the box is enough to play the game you didn't have to buy the tristat nope. nothing nothing else they are completely self-contained think of it like uh the the box sets you can buy of escape rooms or murder mysteries that it's a uh, it's everything you need to play but the difference is you can, can play a campaign from it you don't have to just play a one shot but if you want to consent it's consider those your friday night pick up and go games that's kind of how they were designed that's awesome melkor also known as cbk ply he won this one so congratulations congratulations look at all these giveaways i know i'm, about half, I'm like halfway oh my done God. yep worms all now dragons here before <laughs> actually the background for this one is a little more funny than that i when i read it's like wait what but <laughs> um so Talk about Amber Diceless real quickly. The person who won this one is a huge fan of Amber. Now, I like Amber as far as a universe goes in the setting. I hate the Amber Diceless system. I hate it. I hate gambling for my character. I don't like the point-based stuff. I want to roll dice. But the guy who won this game is a huge fan of Amber Diceless. So I think you and him are now best friends. And there we go. This goes out to Shadow and Son, yeah. who also has his own YouTube channel. So check that out. Shadow and Son, if you are still watching, I know you know that you already won, but uh, yes, you got worms. And you can talk all about Amber <laughs> Dice as you want, just not to me, to him. <laughs> Collusion, yes. Then we had our backers only giveaway. This was a tough one because I didn't know what to do for backers only, but you know what? You guys give us money, and I kind of thought that you should have the game that uh, would ultimately be probably the most popular one, theoretically, although Anime 5e was dang close. And so for our backers, our paying members, thank you very much for those of you who support us. You allow us to do things like these giveaways. And that went out to that darn cat. Yes, Hungar, you're always Rob because you know what? Alimony money goes to me, baby. Ooh. <laughs> actually, it, actually, it, it it does say I was robed. So, oh, uh, there you go. I was robed. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Thank you. You were robed, and uh, please stay that way. <laughs> Good catch. Good catch. And then we have the R3 Sailor Moon products. We have Sailor Moon, Crystal Truth, or Bluff. Yeah, I didn't do these in the right order. Like I said, I couldn't fix the graphic. So, this one comes first. And who won that one? Twilight, Twilight Moon won Moon. this one. Congratulations. So congratulations. Twilight Moon is like, was it Twilight Moon or was it somebody? Somebody said, oh my God, my girlfriend is such a huge Sailor Moon fan. I'm so happy I won this. Well, you know what? I'm glad we can make some people happy. And then we have Imposterous with Big Bad RPG. Now, this is one of those that I want to say. To the person who actually won this before Big Bad, okay. I tried reaching out to you multiple times. You are a backer. I want to support our backers. You pay us money. But for whatever reason, you didn't respond. I had to re-roll it. That was part of the rules. And Big Bad RPG won. Congratulations to Big Bad RPG. I hope you enjoy this. And for the person who didn't win, send me a message. We'll, we'll figure things out. Maybe I'll send you a gift card or maybe I'll just no, say... No, well, no, 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 no. Don't capitulate to people... He's a who backer. Don't, ...who don't understand <laughs> he's, rules. He's a backer. 
but we'll, we'll check that out uh later but uh congratulations big bad rpg who actually is going to get this a uh, box set and i think we have one more yeah one more here we go the two boxer sailor moon i think you already know who's gonna win if you pay attention to the beginning of this yep crystal dice challenge and that goes once more to mildra on, let me, got let me, two let me, let me go back to the og post uh oh there it is Right there, here we go. So <laughs> look at look at all those things we got to give away thanks to you folks out there donating and providing this opportunity. And thanks again to Mark for uh, providing the physical copies of these for folks. Uh, really do appreciate that. And let's get that off the screen. Enough about us. Let's get back to talking about the person we're supposed to be talking about here. So we'll get back to the Kickstarter again because I want to make sure that we have one more opportunity to show it off before you go. But I want to talk to you about gaming and so forth. You good for that? Yeah, I'm up. Let's do it. All right. So got to, got to start at the beginning, right? How did you get your start in gaming, whether as a player or a game master? And how did that uh, roll into you? We'll talk about the development side later, but how did that roll into you wanting to do something like Bessem? Well, like almost everyone from a playing point of view, it was Dungeons and Dragons. I got started in grade eight with the uh, the, the red box set, the, the basic edition that came out. One of my friends got it for Christmas and said, oh, come on over. I got this game. And we tried to figure out how to play it. And it was just the two of us. There, there was no online videos we can watch. And there was no one that we knew that played this thing. Uh, and so we just fumbled through it. And, and looking back, we did it completely wrong. But it was tons of fun. Uh, and so that was the very first time. And then I took Took a pause for a bit for a little bit and then uh when i was working up at the military base that uh, i was working in the the office doing some filing during the summer and met a a, a corporal who said hey i got this done in the dragons game plan do, do you want to come join and i was like oh that sounds kind of cool um you know looking back it was a little creepy with a 32 year old inviting a 16 year old to into his basement to play games but you know hey i didn't know anything about it back then and it was a great opportunity to get exposed and that's how i got into then got the bug for for role playing itself but it when when it comes to the publishing that came uh, after i got introduced to amber and started playing that got into the amber community got to know eric wujic who is the designer of amber and the creator of amber really and so yeah so it was because he's my it, favorite he's my favorite palladium designer oh like yeah Kevin. no he's, uh, he's GMT such a great is my guy. game such a great guy and got to know him and was in the amber con community so there's conventions that were specific for amber going to that uh and meeting one of my friends uh from the uk who was visiting over and doing a train travel trip throughout north america uh was kind of spending a couple of weeks doing that and he when he came to to my city in guelph and i said hey i'll put you up for a night come visit us and we'll go into toronto the the big city near nearby and you know we'll just spend the day together and so we went shopping and one of the things he wanted to go to an anime shop to try to find some stuff that he could not get in the UK easily. And one of the things he bought was the box set uh, of first season of Ronmo one half, which is about probably 12 VHS cases. It was, it was pretty <laughs> large. And he says, I can't take this with me on my train trip. I'll swing back when I'm done before I fly back to the UK. But you know, why don't you keep it here? And Hey, if you want to watch it, go ahead. And I was like, Oh, sure. I know. I know anime. I mean, Astro Boy, Aww. Battle of the Planets. And, you know, I, I had watched it when I was younger, but I wasn't really what I call an anime fan at that point. So I sat through and started watching Ranma one half and it just completely captured my attention. I said, oh, my gosh, I want to play Ranma. This is so much fun. What? What game can I play? Because, you know, uh, yes, I'd moved beyond D&D &D and then I had played different ones. And Amber was really big on that. And I said, well, there's there's nothing out there that can allow me to play Ronma one half. So why don't I just quickly write up my own little system so I can play Ronma with my friends because it looked like. Wait, 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 fun. wait, wait. That, I want you to say that again for Max quickly wrote up your own systems <laughs> tell them t that well that, that was again. that was the goal because Whoa. again amber is a very very light system and i thought oh i can write another light system that's like amber but not quite i wanted to use yeah. dice because i'm a, i'm still in the dice and so i just wanted to write a, a really quick game to do it and that's what yeah, i said you just, out you to just threw it on the back of a napkin right max just threw it on the back of a napkin look just because i have 20 different files of 20 <laughs> different ways i've tried to start my game <laughs> See, 
This is talent. I've got about 3,000 pages written that are not cohesive at all. Yeah, but, you know, you <laughs> well, when I was writing the Ranma game, I realized like, hey, you know, there's more than just Ranma and I'm writing up this point-based structure. And if I just add in a few more things, I can go beyond the rom-com anime genre. I can bring in Mac and fantasy and all these different aspects if I just write a little bit more. Wait, and wait, wait. that's some got, ended I've... up being created from that. Pardon me for interrupting, but I, I've got... So you created the point-based system that you're using now off, out of your own noodle. And I uh, ask that because yeah, yeah, no. I'll, t I'll tell you that I usually say, to me, it seems like it was based on the hero system because it's similar. Well, it, it's 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 not incredibly original. And, and to be fully honest, I had never played Champions or Hero System before making that. It was, wow. it was you know, I, I, I that That's was awesome. one of the, the things missing from my RPG repertoire. I had played, you know, Vampire and I played Fading Suns and, you know, a bunch of other games. But I'd actually never played Heroes of the Champion system. Um, and so when I created it, it's just it seemed to be mathematically a simple way of doing point-based balancing, uh, you know, having a, a heavy science background, maybe, th maybe that helped out. And you know, I think there's only so many ways to do points, maybe into an RPG. Talent. <laughs> Hack. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with the so Amber system, a lot of it comes down to, you have a hundred points and you build your Amber character. And here's a bunch of different things you can do, but it's, it's not really a complex system. I had to go a little bit more complex than that doing best and first edition. And I created a game that was super rules light, but still had a rule structure. And that was the, the initial foundation. So we're looking at, you know, a 96 page digest side, big font book. It, compared to what we're doing now, now is so much more comprehensive and detailed, but still keeps that rules light aspect, that tri-stat system, which was never called the tri-stat system. It was big eyes, small mouth. That was the game. It didn't have a name for the system because I was producing a single game. Um, and I was doing my master's degree at the time in chemistry. And I had got a, a small business loan from the government just to publish a thousand copies of the game. And I thought oh, over my lifetime, I'll sell these thousand copies. I'll make this game for myself, but hey, I might as well make a little tiny business out of it. And within a few months, I was completely sold out. I got nominated for the best RPG of the year for the Origins Award. Um, a lot of critical success with best in first edition. And then I realized, hmm, maybe I can make a go at this. And that's how the company got started. That's awesome. Well, that, that's too, uh, Heathen Dog, do you have any follow-up that you want to ask with regard to playing? Slash, no, just, uh, okay. Just to reiterate for everyone, talent. <laughs> Hack. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you I, Mark, read all 3,000 pages. Yeah, Mark, Mark, where <laughs> everyone, me and everyone in chat is just giving him grief because he's been writing his, his, you know, great American game for, uh, for almost a year now. And almost, no, it's been like, it's been like about three years. Well, you've been talking about it. Oh, yeah. Almost a year now. And we, we, we've seen almost nothing but air. So question and for you, Mark, you how much do you love so. your editors? Uh, <laughs> copy editors are fantastic. There you go. Uh, there you, you know, go. I, I love that when you, when you go into game, like a little bit beyond copy editing, more concept editing, then you can get into some conflicts. It was like, well, you don't not quite seeing the vision that I have. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm at the point now, of course, where most of the stuff we're doing is yeah. in the copy editing phases. Cause you know, we're, we're not creating anything new. Uh, this is just iterations of what we've done for the past 20 years. Uh, but copy editors are, are essential, especially yeah. those extra commas that I have a tendency to throw in. So, so the, the last three jobs I had before this one, I was a technical writer. Mm. So, uh, not, not narrative, but I hate narrative style writing. <laughs> I've learned I, like, uh, like I want clear, concise, consistent, accurate. I want those four things in my game books, but, um, I over edit my stuff and I'm such a, uh, yeah, that that's I end up destroying what I write by over editing. So I, I can edit somebody's book. I can't write a book is what I'm finding out. However, I am going to finish this when I'm 85 years old. <laughs> I've got about 30 years. <laughs> but uh, let me knock out some super chats and then we'll, we'll ask a couple more questions here with regard to uh, playing games and I have those start. I do good. Makes it easier. Weird guy put out the Earth on waits patiently for inebriation. So, yeah, we have a thing here because Earth on's the game I talk about more so than probably any other game, Earth on Drink. So here we go. <laughs> yep. No. Uh, all right. I just found out today that our dice roller can do Earth on Step System dice, Heathen Dog. The one nice. that's on our Discord. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, first rule: of speed writing your own game is to steal rules from another game and don't use D and D, or I'll do bad things to your property. Weird guy is uh, one of the few people out there who didn't start with D and D. 
He started with Palladium, and he makes sure everybody knows that he started with Palladium and not D&D. So uh, good stuff, though. Thank you for the five dollars, sir. And then for ten dollars, Hungar, he's just he's showing the love again. Uh, got to get in tune with Sailor Moon because that cartoon's got the boom no. anime based. Hey, hey, no, 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 no. That, that's copyrighted lyrics. <laughs> get that out of there. Hey, him and DM James always put up songs, and they want me to try to sing them because they know I don't have a clue what they are. <laughs> oh. And Canadian band. All. What's that? Canadian band that sung those. Yeah. Bare naked ladies. Did not they're know Toronto. Yeah, they're what? Toronto. You, you were a teenager in the early and mid nineties. You didn't know you don't know Bare Naked Ladies? I know the name of the group. I didn't know they're Canadian. Oh. Dude, I listen to metal. I don't listen to right. Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> All right. Uh so uh you've obviously said that you've loved Amber. What was it? I mean, how do I say this? Because I don't want to make this sound disparaging. I actually I'm interested. Uh it's just when I think of Amber, I'm like diceless. Oh, gambling for the or bartering for, for the points. Um, what is it about Amber that really grabbed you? Uh, I mean, was it the universe? Was it the world? Or was it the actual game system itself? And if it was the game system, um, I, I guess I, I know it's a narrative thing, but what was it about playing it in the style of game that it is that really just, just struck that nerve with you? You're like, yeah, I, I want to do something more like this. Yeah, well, interesting. So just a little bit of back history with Amber. So I was in high school at the time and I knew I didn't do reading like I, reading uh, was not something I didn't know how to read, obviously, but I did not leisure read. I you know, had done comics like Richie Rich when I was younger and, and uh, you know, Archie, but I was never a big comic fan either. But in when I was getting into high school, knowing I was going to be going to university, I thought I got to learn how to read be, the because there's going to be a lot of reading in university. So I signed up to the science fiction book club and I had to choose, I don't know, seven books or something for a dollar. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to get some science fiction books. And I was looking through the list and there's this book called Amber, which was actually two books. And so the, the person in me is like, Oh, I can get two books for one slot uh, of this, this book club. And so I ordered this, this book called the Chronicles of Amber, which is a two volume set, didn't know anything about it. And I started reading it. And when you start out, it's just, you know, it's some something written in the early 70s. It's just some guy on earth. And it's like, this is weird. Why is this science fiction? And then it starts opening up and changing. And you start understanding about the fact there's other worlds and what these people are and the princes of, of, of the, the universe. And it just completely blew me away on, on how amazing this was. And so it rocketed to the top of my, my favorites list. I was still very much a fantasy fan, but Amber just captured me as like unlike anything else I ever did. Then I was, of course, a subscriber to Dragon Magazine. Uh, and I saw this ad for the Amber Diceless role playing game. And, you know, I was a big D&D fan. I was like, oh, my gosh, there's an Amber role playing game. And I saw an ad for it. So, you know, I put my by twenty five dollars cash in the in the mail uh, and sent it off to Air Ujik's company, Phage Press, to get a copy of this game that I didn't know anything about. And when I got it, uh, to have a dice game, it confused me at first. I, I didn't quite get it. And the first few times I ran it, I actually ran Amber like Dungeons and Dragons because that's all I kind of knew at the time. And so I had, you know, the the familiars and they had the NPCs and I wasn't really running it like the books. And I knew I did, it didn't make sense to me because this is what the books were like. And it that was in high school when I took a break from it. And then in university, I kind of got went back to it. And just as I was starting to get into doing something with it, I was on a co-op work term and uh, managed to find from a gaming store, a little, little advertisement put on the corkboard for playing in an Amber game. And so I had never really understood what Amber was until I found these friends who were younger than me. I was, you know, they were in high school and I was in university. Uh, but when I played in the game, that's when it understood the, the Jesse, the GM understood how to run Amber and the way I didn't. And when I started playing it, it just unlocked the fact that this was all about the characters and the narration, not, not, the game numbers, so to speak, not the dice rolling, where the you know rolling a one on a d20 in D and D when you wanted to do something great and you rolled that one, it was not the situation that it would happen in Amber. It's all narrativistic and what's good for the story. And that, when I started playing that, I realized that that's where I needed to be in the RPG field from from as okay. a player and as a GM. I needed to be in that narrative type system, which I had never encountered before. So it was initially the 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 world of Amber for the Rogers Lasney's novels that captured my attention. But once I started playing, that I that it unlocked 
what I wanted from a role playing game, which was high narration. It's funny that you say that because I think in that regard, you and I are opposite. And it's not bad. I mean, that's what's great about this hobby yeah. is the hobby. It, 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 you know, they say, you know, it, games are for everyone. I, mm. I think certain games are for certain people. I mean, gaming as a hobby is for everyone, but individual games aren't necessarily for everyone. And and that kind of speaks right there because I like the randomness. I like the fact that I'm trying to do something heroic. You know, adventuring is a difficult life. Oh, I slid off the cliff. Man, I, I, I like that kind of thing personally, but that isn't for everybody. And that's why we have more narrative style games and why we have more, I don't want to call them old school games because new ones do it as well, but the, the more randomness, we'll, we'll call it happenstance in games. So uh, I get that because the Amber setting, I like. It's just the game itself. Personally, it's, I was like, where are my dice? I want to roll dice. No, no. We just set up these scenarios and depending on your points versus, I don't want to do that. That sounds like math. <laughs> And, and anything up to that point I had done in Dungeons and Dragons, whether it's, you know, low level characters or higher level characters, it was all about the, the dungeon crawling and the, the direct opposition and the, the killing things and taking their stuff. And moving into role playing where I was plotting uh, advancement for my character outside of fighting and like, how do you advance your personal status in the world and your reputation? And that was a very different structure, which... I think I would enjoy, regardless of what you, whether you had a mechanic, a dice mechanic, or, or diceless. It was the idea of of going beyond the one on one confrontations into mm -hmm. the uh, the social realm of role playing. And that's one of the things I think modern games, like for me, the Year Zero Engine, for example, have done really well with the kind of its its rules light, and I think it incorporates that aspect, of the the social, the. Uh, uh, was it the combat, the social, the exploration, and the survival all into one? And, and again, my, my point in saying this is that there are games for everybody mm -hmm. out there, literally everybody. Uh, I'm going to give Heathen Dog a chance to jump in if he cares to. Well, I I saw this uh, this right here, this uh, fat gamer. Thank you for the five dollars. But uh, question is, someone who only knows Palladium would best him be a good second Megaverse game? No. No, <laughs> I know. I know why you're saying this. I know why you're saying this. No, it's a completely different mindset. Oh, you, you went a different route. That would. Yeah, uh, no, it's a completely different mindset. Palladium multiverse and and Bessem multiverse. It's a completely different animal. You can't go for one or the other and say, "Oh, this is a natural progression." BS. No, it's not. It's not a natural progression. It's a completely different framework. See, I would go. Uh, I would actually use one of your terms. What's that? And say that Palladium, I know you said specifically to Rifts, but uh, Palladium is the best second. I think yeah. Bessem is actually easier than Palladium in this regard. Because uh, while Palladium has a lot more literature written about it, Bessem is just more open by itself. I mean, no, yeah, it the, it the, the, the way you should go is 1980s uh, Marvel superheroes, Palladium, and then whatever, whatever the hell else you want after that but those are the, your two first games if you want to teach someone right that's how you do it that's it mm. you now have the formula go go yonder and frolic with the formula so, have you have you played around with the tristat system i have okay i mean it's simplistic no, it's, it's nice it's nice but yeah. it's 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 no face rip i mean you're you're not reinventing okay. the wheel. Games you can buy today. How about that? Oh, games you can buy today. You shut up with that. All right. There, there's an eBay for a reason. eBay exists oh, wow. for a reason. Well, I, I I'll tell you that uh, the TriStat system is not a system I would run, but it is absolutely a system I'd play in. Yeah, I can see and that. Uh, you, well, and and Heathen Dog owners, it's just like a uh, champions, GURPS, yeah. whatever. I won't run those games. No, you won't. It's not going to happen. But I'd gladly play in them. Uh, and and honestly, the reason why I own my best in books there isn't because they're just lining my shelf because I wanted a couple of white books on there. It's you wanted, honestly you wanted something to steal for his own game. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, that was secret. I'm I sorry. literally <laughs> took nothing from Bessem. <laughs> but it is a game that I would, if somebody were to run it in person, I don't do online games, I would absolutely jump into and play to check out, especially if it's a mecha combat game. Like, give me give me a Robotech out of Bessem or Battletech, whatever, a yeah. uh, Gundam, what, uh, Mechton, yeah. whatever, whatever the, uh, they have out there. I would absolutely play. I just wouldn't run it uh, because Gundam it's Wing. not my, what's that? Gundam Wing. That's the, oh, okay. the, the, the best Gundam series ever. If you don't think so, you're wrong. I'm sorry. I don't know anything about it. So. <laughs> I know. Second, I think is, that, that uh, Dungeons and Dragons is, is one of the 
probably the best games I'd still recommend no, someone no, to not. start role playing. To me, D and D is the mm-hmm. way to start because it has that collective consciousness that everyone understands fantasy. I mean, if if you don't understand fantasy, that would be weird to even start role playing. Yeah. But we, it has we, that we collective consciousness of understanding that. Yeah. Uh, but then also it that leveling based progression, the restricted options actually makes it easier. The, one of the things that I, I think Bessem doesn't make it a good earlier game is because it's it's too many options. It's that analysis paralysis. It's too broad, too big, and doesn't give you enough structure. And I think the structure of like a and d game is a lot easier for people to get started with. Okay. Uh, Bessem, I, I mean, I, I love the TriStat you, system. You heard but it it's first. good when you, when, you, when you have someone else that has played it and then can show you the game. That's how you can learn that. I think D&D, in some ways, you could fumble through and try to figure it out there yourself. There it is. But, but there's, there's one aspect. I'm going to argue with the creator of his own game. No, uh, no, no, there, no there's you one heard it from Mark of... first. If you're playing D&D and that's your only game, you're playing with training wheels, bitch. Oh, get, we've get, said that you before. Know, yeah. Get into the real world. Well, the, 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 I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, so with the, with the D&D and, and the Bessem, one of the things I think you did well with Bessem, and maybe this could be another folio somewhere, and yes, I have Dramatis Personae, but is the templates. I, with, with those templates that you gave yes, there, that makes, uh, yes, absolutely. That that helped me out immensely as yeah. I'm trying to figure out like how this stuff came together. Like how did these points go? And you've got a ton of templates there, and I'm sure there are some online, but a, a set um, a set of D and D style templates, a set of uh, Robotech style templates, a set of uh, just different templates out there would be great for people to get in because the tri set system itself. Okay, so you use 2d6 instead of a d20. Oh, no, but it's generally similar. You roll 2d6, add, a, add some number to it, and that's your result. Like, you can't get simpler than that, I don't think. No, now, I, the, I'd agree for the, for the playing. It's more the, the creation of the yes, characters. And, that, and, and that's that, specifically why I put the templates in there yes, when it came that, to later editions. Second edition, they did not exist. Like, there was no such thing as a you pick a yeah. race and here's a template for it. But I recognize that this, one of the strengths of these introductory style games like D&D, where you, you choose you're a dwarf and then you're a fighter, and it was presented to you as opposed to here's 50 points, build whatever you want. That's that's not introductory. That is that's pretty high level, even though the system itself is simpler. The gameplay is simpler sure. in TriStat. It's a lot easier once you get into the play. But the creation of a character mm-hmm. uh, point based is makes it really difficult yeah. if you're new. You, to the you really can go in the weeds pretty quick if you're if you're not laser focused. But the the whole template thing, I I didn't find it useful for as a template for a kind of character i found it useful to see how how the template jiggered points around how context through example exactly you know you you, you get to see the powers and and how they were changed to make certain effects and that oh i wanted to do something like that but with with a with a giant stompy robot now i know how to work around that using the you using the point system with the with uh you know like effects and stuff like that and, and side effects and all, all all that all that all that stuff that that you can put into a power and seeing it on a template really fit it you know tetris like in my brain like oh okay i can see that now like i had to have someone do that to me the first time i played champions too you mm-hmm. know advantages disadvantages all that stuff i didn't get it at first until i saw someone do it i'm like oh okay you know, I didn't have to have someone teach me with your book because you had the template and that, that showed me it being done. Yeah, I think how the, do you get the more out the of this hundred points? Uh, this whether is how it's you templates do it. or or example characters, like even with absolute power, having the the cast of characters in the world that we've mm-hmm. set up with all the the heroes and the neutrals and the villains and and here's fifty different characters. It's it's not about the characters. It's about now you have context for if I wanted a Superman style character mm-hmm. who's a powerhouse type, I can look at Sentinel and see how his character is built. And now I understand how I can build my own character. Same with your Dramatis Personae book for, for Bessem that you mentioned. We have right. 70 characters in there. You can drop them into any game and use them as they are, or you can use them for inspiration to understand how to create those types of characters. Uh, and that's the the real strength of a system that with point bases, you need those. You're playing d and I can look at a character sheet for a 15th level character and it doesn't really tell me anything because uh, every level yeah, it, it of playing really a fighter you tells you what to what to do you don't you don't have to be very yeah. creative to create those characters no, unlike no. a point-based game right if, if you look at a point-based game you, you can have a brand new character or a character you've been playing for a year and you're going to see how they got there 
You can see it in the points, how they spent the points. How did you get from where you were to where you are? You can see that with, with a, with a game like Dungeons and Dragons, stuff like that. All you see is copying it out of a book. (laughs) Yeah. All you see is the experience point total. You can't look at the character and, and see their journey. You know, like how did you get from first level to 15th level? Whereas a, 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 you know, play a Bessem or Champions or Hero System or even GURPS, you can look at a character and go, okay, I, I see how they got there. You know, started here, got there, you know, got rid of these disadvantages, got these advantages, stuff like that. Like, okay, I, 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 you, you can kind of see the story of the character in their current character sheet. And I, I do like that a lot about uh, the TriSat system and well, m- most point-based systems. So uh, you brought up absolute power and, and I have a question. So once again, <laughs> I'm owning stuff that people are like scratching the head. Why does Max own this? I don't do superheroes. I don't do comics. <laughs> I don't, do... but I have absolute power. The, re- the reason I got it, le- this is less so about playing because I, I-, I want you to correct me on something you kind of did earlier, but we can focus on this a little bit. Is what makes absolute power different than Bessem? Now, from my perspective, obviously we're it's a, it's a different narrative right it's a different setting but is that really all it is a different setting with the bessem rules or is there something more to it from a rules point of view what we did is is uh it's easy the expansion so bessem was we presented kind of a, here's the window here's your stat range here's your attribute range and for 95 percent of anime shows not not dragon ball not something that's on the ridiculous scale of power but for most shows that range that we presented in besom is all you needed when we're doing superheroes that was probably closer to maybe a, a normal marvel style range but to get to the dc level range you know when you're almost playing gods all we had to do is expand out besom and we did initially with silver age sentinels and besom way back uh in the previous company but when we decided to do absolute power, it's taking the, the tri-stat system as presented in Bessem and then expanding it from, say, six attributes levels up to 10 and presenting your stat ranges from 1 to 12. Now it's 1 to 20 or 24. And so it is the same system and they are 100% compatible. Unlike when we previously did Bessem and Silver Age Sentinels, they were never a fully compatible system. They were all just kind of nearly compatible it always off a little bit where Bessem and absolute power are hundred percent compatible. So yeah, if someone had the Bessem system, they don't need the absolute power system. But when absolute power, as you said, the, the main difference is that it presented the world baked in where Bessem, the core rules is a rule system. Absolute power is a game, which is rules okay. plus setting. Okay. So for the folks out there, because this is what I absolutely love about absolute power. What is the premise behind absolute power? And obviously you created it, so you're going to be able to do more justice to it than I can. But I love the premise of the game. Well, what's it's a little bit different than absolute power from almost every other role playing game out there is we set it modern day as if everything in our world has happened. But there's obviously some superpower influences in there. And we set the world so that it's going to progress forward with the timeline of our actual world, but again, with superheroes. So one of the things we wanted to make sure we do, we didn't take away the agency of humanity. So let's just say 9-11 as a great example. You don't want to say 9-11 was done by supervillains because then it takes away from everything that actually happened in real life. Or or, or 9-11 was stopped by superheroes. Or stopped, exactly. So you can say it happened and some of the heroes were involved in the cleanup effort and some of the rescue efforts, but they didn't stop that from happening. We we covered, because of the the way that the game is set on December 31st, 2000, that's when Absolute Power is set, COVID happened. And we actually have a a part of the game where we talk about where one of the, the two great superheroes are talking. It's like, well, can't you just solve COVID? Can't you just eliminate it? And they're like, no, we, we, we know there's going to be a snapback. If we use magic to do this, there's a price to pay for this. And so the, the great healers of the world, the magicians, the superhero magicians didn't cure COVID. Um, They didn't stop all the terrible things that are happening in the world. Because again, we don't want to take away agency from the the terrible and amazing thing that humans actually do, but we're overlaying on top of there a superhuman world. And as it progresses forward, all the same things that are happening in our world are also still happening in 
the Empire uh, Earth world, the difference is there's a superhero influence. And that's different than most. So yeah, you can look at, say, uh, you know, the Marvel comics or the DC comics, and they are kind of set modern day. But there, when it comes to role playing games, there's nothing like that in the superhero field that we created a world where Empire City is it's obviously New York City, but it's Empire City, and there's have all the 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 superheroes and supervillains in it. But it's still our modern Earth, and the president is still the president. And there was a changeover from Trump to uh, Biden. All of that happens within the actual world. And how do we integrate superheroes with this? With and how we explain away that superheroes didn't stop 9-11 or Ukraine. When we get to dealing with 2001, 2002, we have to address Ukraine and what's happening there. We can't just have superheroes come in and stop it. Are, are you meaning to say 2021 and 2022? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 21. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yes, you, you kept saying 2000. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yes. Like, 20, okay, 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time I figured it was a mistake, but now he's doing it again. I got to no, make sure. No. Uh, thank you okay. for correcting that. Uh, yeah. And so when the, the world is advancing in there, we are addressing how that's happening. And it's it's pretty amazing that we've managed to bring in, in the past, superheroes, invasions, invasion from other universes, and integrated that all with the real world life that we have uh, in superheroes. It's it's a very challenging thing to write, but, but very, uh, a lot of fun, a lot of creativity there too. So the premise yeah. of the absolute power corrupting how does that affect game? Oh, play? sorry. Yes, thank you for that. So with the uh, so the reason why we, we did that, it was Silver Age Sentinels. That when we came out with that in um, the early two thousands, we wanted to have a superhero game that was about heroism. And there was a lot of the this dark alternate superhero stuff. And certainly with the the image years of the comics, where it was really big, like the the dark superhero stuff was big. And we were like, no, we we want. We want to, to get that here was in the Silver Age, but we don't want to be a Silver Age game. That this is we don't want to be setting a game in the fifties and sixties. So modern day, two thousand, but Silver Age ideals. When we decided to do a sequel and do the next edition, we could have just called it Silver Age Sentinels two point but we thought that the world had changed. Our real world had changed so much in those twenty years. We didn't want to have a dark superhero, but we wanted to have a where the shine of the Silver Age is is come and gone. Like it's no longer the the shiny aspect of silver. And we know, especially after nine eleven, was we saw a lot of government reaching where it's like we can keep you safe. Just give us a little bit more power. Just give us a little bit more, you know, curtail your liberties a little bit, and we can keep you safe. And hey, as a Canadian, I kind of like some of that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm very big on government doing good things. I uh, and and you know, we saw it in COVID, the the response that we had with the Canadian government. I liked what we we're doing in Canada. Uh, some people didn't, but there's chat always... is about to go crazy, and I'm gonna have to censor <laughs> everybody. <laughs> uh, but the idea of we know, yeah. Every law enforcement agency, every superhero, they can do a better job of protecting us if they just have a little bit more power, a little bit more authority, reach a little bit further, maybe do, maybe come down a little bit harsher on the villains. And absolute power was not about, you know, the way that phrase comes from is power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And it's not to celebrate the corruption of absolute power, but to warn against what can happen. And so we have our heroes, our Superman style uh, human, you know, the, the Sentinel, and we have the Wonder Woman style person and the, the Batman style person. And obviously with a lot of analogies with our world set up and they have to constantly fight against wanting to take away uh, maybe a little bit more agency from humanity because Kingdom they come. can do a better job. Kingdom come is, Oh, that is perfect analogy. Um, really, really Max good. Get that uh, <laughs> Kingdom come is one of my, probably my favorite superhero comics of all time. When that graphic novel was fantastic. And it's at what point, how far do you go? And it's that struggle. And so you do have obviously, you know, government sanctioned superhero teams, which, play very much in line with what you'd expect a government sanctioned superhero team do but how do the the bastions of liberty and freedom how do they cr help keep you safe while at the still time at the same time um let you maintain your humanity and let you be humans that is what what absolute power is about it is not allowing it to corrupt absolutely but it's against yeah. that lure of that potential corruption mm. I, I like the premise and and you know being say uh as the america as south south of the border 
you know, I'm, I'm from, you know, originally from Minnesota. So I was pretty much Southern Canadian anyway, but uh, I now live in Alabama. Um, you know, the mindset could be a little bit different. And what's cool about that is what I've read so far. And to be fair, I read it when I first got it. I haven't gone back to it, but I saw that there's a lot of openness to it. And what I mean by that is as a game master, you can play this kind of how you want. You can play that. We'll go more America. Uh, freedom trampled on is bad, you know, or you could play. No, uh, it's a it's a more of a benevolent dictatorship style like uh, Heathen Dog has talked about a few times or anywhere in between. You can run it how you want. You're not, you're you don't have to sit there, you know. And and say that, oh, hold on, let me look at what Canada, let me look at what Sweden did, let me look what America did. No, you can just play it what feels natural for you and your table. It does not have to be a political game other than, oh, let me rephrase it, a real world political game. Right. It's for you to play on these fantasies and the game master to take care of how the world reacts to that. And I want to be careful in how I say that because, uh, you know, we, we're, we're pretty big about no politics <laughs> You know, talking here, but you know, if the game has it, you've got to talk about it a little bit. And then, of course, well, there's only one right way. Well, if that's how your table plays, that's how your table plays. And I can tell you from the bit that I've read, the game leaves it open for your own table and interpretation. It tells you what's happened. It tells you how I want to say the results. It tells you how you know, kind of that human nature is, superhuman nature is, and very much like what Mark said about um do we do this power grab or do we not do this power grab but that's going to be for your table to decide and i actually like that like just me personally i like that um i don't know I, you know because because otherwise what would it be it'd just be superheroes doing whatever they want right i mean i've got all the power magneto was right i got all the power these people should be listening to me and we see lots of examples with that in you know, TV shows as well as comics. I mean, that's not an uncommon way uh, of of doing superheroes, that if you are that powerful, you could do anything you want. Uh, but we try to also, you know, it, and it's writing that line of giving you a, a fixed structure of a setting while also leaving all the room in that setting to do what you want. And, it, and it's a balancing act. I think we do a pretty good job on it, as you mentioned, that we don't tell you how to play it, but we obviously have to give you the, the predilections of the different characters in the game. We can't say, here's a character, he can be whatever you want, because otherwise it's not a character, he's a concept. Right. And But we provide actual characters, but then we give that room to play uh, on there. And that's one of the things that's really important for the creative team on Absolute Powers to make sure that we, we present the the opportunities for you to mm -hmm. play it how you want. And then flip a few things on its head where we have, you know, the, the Dr. Doom style person, cruise writer in our game, you know, he's, you know, runs, he's a dictator of an Island and they have universal basic income there. Like it's, it's like, Whoa, how, how did that happen? It's like, well, that dictatorship has realized the best way to deal with his citizens is to give everyone free money. Uh, and that'll make everyone happy and productive. And this is something and that you wouldn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't expect to see it in, in this style of this type of character. We have Cruise Rider. This is one of the, the just fantastic things. I don't know if a lot of people are really going to see it, but this is our big bad. This is our, our number one biggest villain. And he's looking at the world and thinking, am I relevant anymore? Look at who else is in this world. Like at one point, you know, my ideals were like, hey, I was a little radical. And now I look at some of the other political leaders of what Putin's doing. Did I turn into a John guy? Moon, Did the like, get so bad that now I'm the voice of reason? That's kind of what it's like. Yeah. You know, do, do I have a role anymore? Because there's all these humans that are that are taking the stance that I did as a supervillain, and that's a just a really interesting thing. Which is why we couldn't call it Silver Age Sentinels 2.0. Which is why Absolute Power was the right thing to change that name okay. because it did change the perspective of all the characters in the past 20 years. And I do want to say to folks in my chat, I haven't seen it here, but when we did go through Absolute Power a few months ago, uh, and I was scrolling through it, uh, some people called out the fact, and here's the thing, this is why you can't judge a book by its cover, okay, by a picture inside the book. Man, did people go crazy when they saw the superhero with a mask on. Holy crap, did, did I get a bunch of pushback for that? You said the game wasn't woke and blah, blah, blah. Read the book. You have to understand the premise of it. And I, when I, I didn't even notice it when I was scrolling through. When I went back and somebody showed it out to me, it's like, oh, what the hell? But then as I'm reading the book, I was like, oh. And Mark just explained it a moment ago very well. You've got, you've got to read. You have to understand what's going on in the world. So don't go running out there going, ah, that, that stupid game's woke. Read through it. Now, if the game's not for you, it's not for you. But there's so much more going on behind the scenes that you at your table 
can address and have fun with. Like universal basic income. No, that's not something I support. However, think about the things that would happen around on a, an island that might cause that to come into play. All of a sudden you start looking at things like, huh, and one of the things we've talked about on our channel a lot, and pardon me for getting political here, but, I, but I've got to put some of this stuff out here, is, oh, communism's worst thing ever. Uh, you know, in, in small units, communism is usually the best form of government. Yeah. It's when no, it gets no, uh, too big that it's the no, problem. You exactly. Know. You're absolutely right. I mean, this, this small island, if it has a very valuable export that can only be found there, like oil, vibranium, uranium, plutonium, uh, unobtainium, whatever, whatever in your game it is, <laughs> they, they can fund universal health care for their small island and import all the things they need to survive for all of the, all the citizens to have for free because their unobtainium is so important to the world and they dole it out in little pieces to make sure it doesn't lose its value. That makes that beers makes and sense. diamonds, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the beers and diamonds. Exactly right. It makes perfect sense. Can and be done. One of the things to consider, but that, that particular image, we knew that it was, you know, with Sentinel having, you know, a mask on, you know, in front of a kid. Um, what was really important about that is for us to have, and again, not getting into politics, but the the ideals behind what the characters are thinking of. Here's a, a character who is immune to every disease. So yeah. he, he can't catch COVID. He can't carry COVID. But a superhero, like a Superman type, that's who the Sentinels kind of based on Superman and Captain America mixed together, wears a mask in public to show something rather than the actual effect of what it does. He Set was the example. Exactly. He was like going to a children's hospital to give out toys to children who are, you know, this is before the, the vaccine came out. Um, and so he he chose to wear a mask as the, the superhero that no one would have said you needed to wear one. And yet he did because of the inspiration. He's an icon for the world. And he was, you know, playing along with the idea that masking are important. And so that particular image was was so important to the idea of who Sentinel is and Max Liberty, that character. Um, it was, we knew it was going to, you know, some people were going to work up a little bit about, you know, seeing Superman wearing a mask. But for us, it was, it was about who that character was. And it said volumes in that one image. You know, Heathen Dog and I have talked about uh, paladins and Dungeons and Dragons. So let's just say we have a mm -hmm. different view of what paladins are than what the modern version of paladins. And one of Heathen Dog's examples of that is that Superman is a paladin. Now, Again, politics aside, I don't care what anybody thinks about masks or, or mandates or uh, uh, vaccines or whatever. But if if the presentation of that time is wear your mask to be safe, wouldn't the paladin set the example? Oh, yeah. And it's a really good analogy because paladins are also immune to disease, sickness. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, good one. Yeah. So let's hit some super chats here. Uh, cause I definitely want to throw up the Kickstarter again. I, if, if you're okay with this, we, we can go for another 15 minutes or so. Um, yeah. okay. Sounds good. Just want to make sure that, you know, you're not like, Oh my God, guys. Let no, me no. Go. That sounds good. Uh, so back for a long time ago, hunger surveillance is Bon Jovi is a metal. Remember when I said, I only listen to metal music. Yeah. He Queen's heard the story is metal light. Well, no, so, okay. So the story is this when I, back when I was growing up, my parents listened to, what's that? Elvira, my heart's on fire. You know, that, that could, Oak Ridge Boys in Alabama and whatever else, you know, it's more country-esque, right? So when I got my first chance at getting a metal album or a rock album, right? My friend had uh, Bon Jovi and Twisted Sister. It was Bon Jovi, well, Slippery and Wet. And I picked Bon Jovi. Okay, you went the wrong way on that one. I, I, <laughs> So anyway, yeah. So that was my first rock album was it was a Bon Jovi album. Yeah. So yeah, I listen to chick music. Leave me alone. <laughs> All right. Fat Gamer says, question. Oh no, we already we already did this one. Yeah, we already did I that one. Guess I had that one start. Right. Um also the he, well, weird guy, I had to wait on this one because it said Amen to Heathen Dog. Forget that. But for thank well, you for now, the $2. now we don't know what exactly he was talking about. Um you know what? I remembered for the longest time, and now I don't. And now, when it's important, you don't. Thank you very much. Just pick, Move on. Just pick something, whatever you thought was great. Thank that you, you said. weird guy. <laughs> and finally, only politics I like is if we coalition soldiers shoot, dimen shoot dimensional beings on sight, or do we shoot twice on sight? There you yes. Go. So, yes. A lot of Palladium references here because we're actually in our year of Palladium books. You have interrupted the year of Palladium books. <laughs> yes. Today was going to be all about riffs. The actual riffs, not the game riffs, the riffs inside the game riffs. 
But is that what we're talking about next week? Is that what we're talking about? Because I don't have the graphic. Okay, we're going to talk about riffs. Got it. Um, It was uh, Heathen Dog's rant uh, on D&D. Okay. Okay, there there it is. See, I, I'll tell you that D&D, I actually agree. I know some people in chat didn't agree, but I, I agree with the whole fact that D&D is, is playing with training wheels, especially 5e. But I also go back old school and say, Beck me. Beck me is a great way to teach people how to play D&D. Why? Because it's well, first book, levels one through three, only dungeon crawls. Next book, level three through 14, add some wilderness out there. Next book, you know, so forth. I love the way it walked you, walked you through that. So, I mean, you could consider that to be training wheels as well, but we're not here to talk about D&D. Yeah, but it's, it's built in to take the training wheels off at some point. Yeah, right, right. You know, it's, you know. Well, 5e was meant to be an evergreen game. Why it's not now, who knows? But, uh, you know, because of one d d coming up. But um, back on here, I, I only have one thing that I wanted to talk to you about that hasn't been answered. It's kind of backtracking just a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I would like to talk about, so we have a bunch of people in our midst here who are either writing their own games or trying to or think about writing zines or think about just somehow getting into publishing. And I'd like to talk about going into <laughs> shut up. That's Hack. different. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> um, but uh, about uh, everything that you want to talk about, whether it's from the process to the getting started, but the, basically the trials and tribulations of this with, uh, and I'm not going to bring up dirt. Every single person I've ever had on here has some dirt in the background. I don't care about that nonsense, but, but the actual, the, the but the stumbling about things that you went into like uh oh and you tripped over it fell on your face a little bit but had to get up and now here you are successfully you know publishing best in 4e uh absolute power anime 5e all these different things but you had to start from some humble beginning somewhere so See, how did I, that process i would be offended at this question what if luck is just one of his skills and he's never actually failed <laughs> great so, some then some people would say me. that some that's the say story that, of uh, my life that, that everything I wanted, I've gotten. For I've succeeded <laughs> everything with barely any effort. Okay. So, for the know, rest of us human way. beings who do not have the absolute power. <laughs> <laughs> so the the question kind of it's, it's almost two parts because there's mm-hmm. the designing part and then there's the publishing part. So publishing being running a company part versus the designing part. Were you looking at one particular aspect or the no, other? Just, just kind of, just kind of, of soup to nuts, just, just talking about the envelope. Yeah. I mean, it could be a hundred parts. Your really. particular I mean, journey. In right. doing yeah, yeah, yeah. How your journey in there. And then the big thing is uh, for me is like helping people, hey, you're going to have these troubles. It's not as easy as you think to do these things. Ke- like when Kevin Simbita was here, he's talking about how he was printing off pamphlets and people are saying, by the way, you priced your thing too low. So nobody wants it. It's like what priced mm. it too low? You know, <laughs> things like that, you know, as, as he grew to what now is obviously is Palladium books. And I'm sure you've had similar, you know, he's had IPs and then lost IPs. Mm. He, you know, all, all, there are these just professional developments over the year uh, that people go through. That, you know, that I, I think is good for people to know that it's not all honey and roses at the same time. It's not all, you know, vinegar and poison either, right? Right. Well, certainly it's it's understanding your strength and your weaknesses and playing to both of those. So as a designer, my strength is not in the narrative writing the the, the more fictional aspects of it uh, and the creation. My strength is in the tactical game design stuff. That's where, where I shine. So r- that's why I have a creative director. Uh, Robin does, uh, they do all of the creative writing. So they created the absolute power you know, the next 20 years and the world setting. Well, I was, I'm the system person. That's what I do. So th- that's my strength. Robin's strength is uh, with the fiction stuff. And so I think if you can realize what your strengths are and play to that, that's going to save a lot of problems. When it comes to the, the the publishing aspect about getting games out into the market, that's where it also comes to ideally, you're going to lean into your strength. And when, when I look back at when I was 1997, 98, when I started this, uh, I did not have any business experience. And that, you know, a few years later bit me in the ass when the company went belly up because um, too much, too much debt and too much, um, too many unpaid bills because I didn't understand business at the time. And the analogy that I used at the beginning, I mean, we, we were a pretty popular company for a, for a smaller press. Uh, but the analogy I use is when, you know, it's a nice sunny day, uh, it, you know, it's easy to drive a car, drive on the road, it's a straight road, sun shining. And that was me at the beginning. It was all a beautiful day. When the bad weather started hitting, I didn't know how to drive. And so that was the Canadian dollar exchange rate when I was getting a dollar sixty-two Canadian for every dollar American, and most of our sales were American. Most of my expenses were Canadian. 
and forth with employees. When I was getting a dollar sixty-two, and then it dropped to one thirty, and and I just even if sales did not change, my income changed dramatically. I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to deal with credit that I was offered, and so the the for most people now, I mean, this was at a time where you had to to publish. You had to be a company. Now you can just publish something on drive through either maybe under DMs Guild or uh, if you're doing something D and D ish. Never, or never do some, that. Or if you're doing well, I mean, or you're doing Tristat. We have an emporium which is people can create their own stuff and publish best some stuff uh, on on drive through, and they kind of use our brand and our name to help their sales. And the advantage now is you can. Be creative and put yourself out to the world to see it without having to invest all this time and money where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that was the really only way to getting kind of real penetration was to go out there and and invest in your company. And in the end, my first company didn't succeed with that investment. Now, Kickstarters, um, a lot of people are running Kickstarters on something they create on the, the Dungeons and Dragons Guide to Herbs and and trees and boom, they can create something successful and they don't have to have the whole infrastructure of a company. So it has certainly changed in what's happening, but I'd say that the, the availability now for people to be creative, to spread the love of what they want to do, the buy-in is a lot smaller now. And uh, if you have a, if you have a weakness, if you're not good at technical writing and system stuff, then maybe find someone that is, and you f- focus on the, the non-system aspects of it, the more narrative or story structure aspect of what I want to publish. Uh, those are probably the biggest takeaways that I have that I've learned a lot since my first company went under and I started the second company, uh, a lot changed with, you know, how I approach business and understanding numbers and, and spreadsheets better, but also the Kickstarter community changed completely what would used to be we used to invest everything up front and hope you sell versus now you get to find out what you have to invest out by running a Kickstarter and see if there's even demand for it. So I agree with about 90% of what you said there, but there's this 10% and I think Heath and Doug was going to allude to it is thanks to things like DM skill and Kickstarter, the quality has dropped dramatically. And I'm not talking about your products. You're definitely, you definitely have a, a, a professional product, but I don't accept any Joe Schmo out there writing that can't understand capitalizing a letter. I don't care how creative you are. I will not read your nonsense if you can't spell words correctly. And I've seen a ton of that out there. And that's kind of the, 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 the unfortunate pitfall of this is like, you know, you've got, you've got to still have an editor or somebody that that proofreads your stuff, folks. Come on. Uh, but other other than that, other than the quality actually going down, I do agree with you. The imagination is out there. People are able to put things out there. Uh, uh, never on DM Guild. Never. Well, never well certainly when, when you lower the, the barrier of entry, you're going to, of course, increase the number of, of get crap more garbage. products out there. There's no yeah. doubt about it. You're going to get more garbage. Um, but that says, while the quality has gone down, it doesn't mean your product is going to go down in quality or my product or someone else's sure. product. If you have a good quality product, it doesn't matter how bad everyone else's stuff is. If you're good and you create something that, that is engaging and is going to be interesting and the barrier is now lower that you can enter where you couldn't previously... Uh, yeah, you do have to try to find a way to stand out from all the the, the garbage out there. Well, you but just, you just put the first line. This is not a garbage product like the last three products you've seen on this site. <laughs> there, there you go. Wow. Uh, and, and 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 certainly the 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 realm. I mean that that garbage product that goes way back to the old debate about you know when desktop publishing came out and everyone can do their own desktop publishing it was like oh the graphic designers think that everyone else is crap and it's too easy to yes, lay out did. a book now uh because it was easy to lay out a book now yeah. it's easy to it publish a book where it wasn't before <laughs> and so the barriers have gone down but if, if what people are interested in being creative in that way they can they can do their stuff if they're you know doing it as a hobby or maybe a pro hobby kind of thing but enjoying it uh, that's the way to get into it. To to still be a to, to to be a new free leak publishing or a green Ronin or some some other larger mid size mid size small company even to to be one of those that's still an awful lot of work and involves mm-hmm. a lot of luck and involves a lot of knowledge and and capital. There's no doubt about it. But now you can be me. Uh, you know when I had a previous company and I was eight 
employees at one time. Now I'm a company of two people and we're doing more interesting stuff now than I was back when I had eight people because the infrastructure has changed in what you need to be a publishing company now. And so our costs are lower, we're more profitable, we can pay more money to our freelancers uh, and we can have products that are that are really creative. And I think being small and agile is certainly possible with the, the what's available in the gaming industry now. But you have to know where your weaknesses and strengths are. Don't try to do everything if you're not an everything kind of guy. Well, th- th- you kind of spoke to me there because uh, as uh, what, I've been doing everything. everything. Come well, on. I don't you're ch- not I don't an ch- anything kind of guy. What's that? <laughs> Hack. Okay. Well, as far as my game goes, no, I, I, I have, I've been trying to do everything and I have some reasons for that, that are in the background, but, uh, I absolutely, yes, wish that there were a couple more people that I could, uh, I could count on as far as, you know, helping me design what I'm doing here, but I need to get it They're to a point where you just got to give them money, huh? you just gotta give them money and they have to be professional. They'll, 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 they'll take money and they'll, they'll help you on your game. There, that's that's called employees. You can do that. Mm-hmm. He does it. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go. Right <laughs> there, well, no. I, I think we found your problem. <laughs> how can I how can I pay somebody when I'm not making money? Right. There's so. there's another problem, but that, that's what business. <laughs> well, we'll are get for. to that point. But uh, uh, yeah, but if, but for other people out there, well, I, I think you said something that was really important. Uh, you know, Kevin touched on it. Grim's touched on it. You've touched on it here. Is that this isn't an easy process. You might have 40 notebooks with all your house rules at home and you want to compile those up. That's great. Maybe you can put them in order, but do you know the desktop publishing side? Do you know how to use InDesign or or Scribus or whatever's out there? Uh, Are you just going to put it in Google Docs and sell it that way? A couple of people have done that and actually have been successful on it. Are you going to let people look at it beforehand? How do you plan on selling it? Because, I mean, Kickstarter isn't just for the small person anymore. We've got Brandon Sanderson making however much money he just did on there. Uh, you had uh, Keanu Reeves uh, on there with his comic book a couple years ago. I mean, it's for big. And I know people feel ways about things about that, but it is the way forward. People are going to do that. You have Kevin right now has his own Kickstarter out there. Uh, you know, this is just how it's going to be. You've got competition. Money is tight now for a lot of people. I don't care what country you're living in. Money uh, is becoming tight so people are going to spend it on what they want to spend it on and you're unfortunately going to have to spend it on yourself if you want to produce them that's just Mm -hmm. you know uh and then the effort the time energy that goes into that a lot of people don't understand so let's um let's throw up a couple things here then i think uh (laughs) we're at two hours i appreciate you taking the time to uh, be here for us we're probably good Uh, now i'm gonna start uh start here so we have Discami dot ca oh yeah canada uh you can buy a whole ton of products there look at all that sailor moon crystal well we'll get to the drive through rpg thing here in just a moment i do have a starred comment on there i will get to it that talks about more than just drive through rpg but there we go you can get absolutely is it still pre-order oh no thanks no that that uh, has to be updated it is actually ordered now it is it is shipping out so yeah thanks we'll make that adjustment I just caught that myself, <laughs> but uh, obviously you can get Besom and Anime 5e. I know like myself, when you were on last time, we kind of made a comment about why 5e and you said, well, money. <laughs> I mean, very yeah. well, uh, you know, obviously I can't stand 5e, so I have literally no interest in this, but on the flip side, so many people were interested in that. Yeah. M- money That's and, uh, you know, as a game designer, it was a challenge for me. It was something that I almost kind of had to, I felt I needed to, Polish your make, turn. Make, yeah. make up for the <laughs> problems that I did with best of 20, which was just the money grab back when I did that. I yeah. wanted to see, can I properly make an anime D and D game and, you know, using everything I did. And I think I did a spectacular job compared to what I did before. And, and you know, I was up to the challenge and for, there was a, a professional development thing going on with that as well. But you know, Excellent. if, if it, if I didn't think it was going to be successful, I probably would have done it just for professional development. That's what the tri-stack games are for those little mm-hmm. box sets. Those were never going to be particularly profitable. I knew that going into them, but those are professional developments of how can I adjust the system and play with the system to get it and bend in different ways. Awesome. Well, as far as, I mean, we've talked to like Kevin, you know, from Palladium with regard because so he and Doug and I, and I'll speak more for myself, but generally speaking, we're kind of purists when it comes to games. If I want to play Bessem, I'm going to play Bessem in TriStat because that's where it belongs. <laughs> like, like if I'm going to play Palladium, I'm not playing Savage Worlds Rifts. I'm playing Rifts Rifts. 
Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, things like that. I, I don't like when companies, what I call muddy the water. Now you've explained this is a little bit different motif for it, but uh, generally speaking, I, I believe if I want to play 5e. I'm just going to play 5e. But let's be honest also, it's the 800 pound gorilla. It's a setting. It's a system that so many people know already. Like you were talking about that before for like introductory into gaming. Well, why not attach it to something that they already know and then maybe have them slide over to Bessem after they're used to anime 5e. And I can understand, I'm not saying you said that, but I'm just saying that's how I envision it. I can, uh, I can understand that. But for my, my money, I'm going to put it toward, hey, wh what, what is the system I'm playing? What is the original version of it? That's how I'm going to play it. Hopefully that makes sense. I guess what I'm saying is please don't make everything go anime 5e. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, it's it's a viable line the way it is. And it was designed rather than, I think, having anime and push it into D&D &D rules. It's how do I take D&D &D and expand it into anime? And how do I mm -hmm. take the box that characters are typically in in a game and just make the box bigger? And those are bringing some of the ideas that I have with the point-based system from Bessem, bringing those in so you can have your fighter type person who knows one spell they know fireball because they grew up in the fire tribe and that's that's their backstory and you can have a fighter with fireball well you can't do that in DD. Yeah, it doesn't so exist this is a way for us to just expand the box of character options and that's one of the the real driving reasons to do anime 5e and keep it as a viable line on its own do you want to at all talk about uh your uh, Sailor Moon Crystal line is as far as because I know my audience might not be the biggest proponents of that. Yeah, well, line, actually, the, but the, there's kind yeah. of a story behind that that uh, I thought was interesting. So there, but the license is is kind of ending on that, uh, and oh, so okay. with yeah, with the license that will be removed from our store shortly, and it uh, oh. kind of doesn't, you know, it's just we we ran through it, and unfortunately there was a lot of uh, delays on approvals and whatnot. We only got three games out plus the one expansion. We had thought we'd have a much bigger line. We had planned to do a role playing game for it, uh, but we got rejected just because there's too much too many words uh, in the role playing game, and so it was uh, not the the experience we wanted because we thought we could do a lot more. It if we were given uh, more freedom to create it with it, but it's it's pretty well done now. We had a good run with some tabletop stuff. We're we're really jumping fully into the role playing games that we have right now. Okay. Uh, well, what I liked what you were starting to talk about the other day was uh, that I thought was interesting was how hard it is to get the licenses now for these. Uh, yeah. for the, and and anytime anybody talks anime and licensing, I automatically go into apoplectic fits over Harmony Gold. I can't stand Harmony Gold uh, at all in any way, shape, or form. I have literally nothing nice to say about them. Not expecting you to say yay or nay to that. But but uh, but it's how it was easier back when there was less technology than, there, than it is now when you think it's just send an email and get an email response back. I, I found that to be somewhat interesting. Yeah, glo globalization has actually made licensing more difficult with the Japanese anime companies. When it was less globalization, when everything was was done in the States and all the Japanese companies sub-licensed everything to U.S. companies, and it was easier to deal with the, the, the U.S. companies. Dealing with yeah, Japanese they, companies is more of a standardized contract difficult. for U.S. workers, you know, for, for U.S. companies. Here's, here's, the, here's the form. Put in the name of IP, name of company, <laughs> sign the dotted line, and, and you're you're good to go for three years, right? Whereas now it's all you know case by case basis. It's good here, it's bad there. You have to do this now because we're more popular and and people have more more access to our to our original stuff. So why would you want to have you and change it? Well, and the further you're removed from the original creator, the less that company is probably going to care about it being right in some way. Right. Like I take great, great um, pride when we did the Sailor Moon role playing game back in 1998. Like it was like I remember how much work I put in it. It was a perfect Sailor Moon role playing game. It was perfectly aligned with the license. Um, and to me, that is the what I wanted to create. But the companies there. Uh, back then, they you know, a lot of the, the U.S. companies didn't care too much how accurate it was because it wasn't their company. They had sub-licensed it from the Japanese company. And dealing with a U.S. Uh, company that is that is more concerned probably about the, the financial aspect than the creative aspect of it uh, was easier from a licensing point of view. Now it's a lot more difficult. Mm. And I, I just find that to be interesting because you'd think it'd be the opposite, but I... Yeah. I, I all right, let's uh, move on to the next. We have Japanime Games, your partner with Japanime Games. Of course, I put the, the best of stuff up here because that's uh, what we're talking about. If folks want to go there, but I have a question for you. And if you can't answer it, no problem. I was going to do 
potentially a giveaway uh, from here of like a $25 gift card. But when I went to the gift cards, it said $1 and I had to order 25 of them. And I'm scared that would give me 25 keys of $1 gift cards. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. Do you know wow. how it works here or no? no I actually don't. So Japan Anime Games, okay. they they handle our sales and its distribution. So we don't deal with retailers and distributors directly. We deal okay. with the public. Uh, they carry us through all the main distributors who then sell to the retail stores. So how they operate their website and everything that they do, we actually don't know anything about them. Okay. Well, the important reason why I brought up Japan Anime Games is because, well, Discami is great for Canadian customers. Mm -hmm. If you're an American buying, you want to go to Japan Anime Games, which I just put the link into chat there as well. And you're going to want to buy from here. So yeah, uh, if, if you end up buying through through our website, no big deal. We, we, you know, we have a good relationship with Japan Anime Games. We'll take care of it. We have lots of people who, uh, you know, buy through our website that are Canadian. Uh, so not a problem there. And if you need some help with, uh, you know, gift certificates, just I mean, no, I want Canadian paper, damn you. it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know who's been faster at responding to emails, Kevin Sambita or Mark. I'll send Mark an email. It's like, oh, crap, it's Sunday at 10 p.m. Oh, well, well, I've got to get it out before I go to work tomorrow. Also, I've got a response back. Like, go to sleep. <laughs> but to know. So he's, uh, uh, we, we, there are a couple of issues in the past. There's a printing issue with a Besson book. Uh, uh, he and might remember with Baldahar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But because of how quickly Mark resolved that, Baldahar bought more stuff. <laughs> So uh, he's actually showed it off to me more stuff that he's bought. So I'm not saying email, I'm not saying spam him. I'm just saying that hey, there's good customer service here. And uh, again, uh, you can tell he's got passion for his own business, which you might not think is unusual, but uh, in my experience, it kind of is unusual. Just buy my stuff, man. No. So uh, obviously, good customer support there. So, but yeah, uh, you can buy the American stuff. The American stuff. Wow, you can buy if you're living American in America. Distributor. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, buy from the American distributor uh, through Japan and make game, which I put the link in the chat. Also, there is Drive Through RPG. Question for you. Drive Through RPG. I got two questions for you. The first one is, are any of these print on demand? And if no, why not? So because we sell everything on drive through all the main products, like not a $2, you know, three page extra characters, but all the products we have print copies of. So we don't do print on demand because it's not the level of quality that we want. When we... Right. When we go to professional presses, uh, that produces the quality that we want. And so we don't offer print on demand for something we actually have print copies for, uh, which is specifically why we don't do that. So if you want Anime 5e, you can buy it when we printed it on pro presses, not print on demand presses. Okay. okay. I next? accept that answer because you're still selling your stuff. Next week in segment two, we're going to be talking about a company that doesn't still sell stuff and I can't get it in print. Um, right. So, but if you guys want to check out, you can look at these long line of things here. I'm not going to scroll. I probably can't scroll. Yes, I can, I can scroll. But uh, yeah, all types of uh, goodies there on Drive Through RPG. Now, there's a new one. You may not have heard of it yet. It's called Big Geek Emporium. What does Big Geek Emporium have to do to possibly get your business on that website? Because uh, I know a lot of people in my circle. In fact, when I, I was giving out gift them. cards, we're like, I don't want it from Drive Through. I want it from Big Geek. They're a, they're a PDF style company. Yes, it's it's new. It's very right. small so far, but it's trying yeah. to grow. And I'm not going to put you on the spot. I don't do that. But I'm just yeah. saying, like, uh, uh, it would be awesome if uh, our folks could find your products on Big Geek Emporium as well. Yeah. See, for a company like us and, and many other companies, uh, most of us go exclusive with one distribution company because it's a it's a central point and it doesn't fracture the the sales base. It allows us to point everyone in one direction. And a lot and of the contracts that, that and drive through would have, um, you know, if you have an exclusive deal with drive through, you get a higher percentage of the royalties when you make it's five percent so, more and Big Geek only charges 10 percent. Yeah, which is which is inexpensive, but there's there's also there are crowdfunding places that charge less money than Kickstarter does. But there's a reason we're still on Kickstarter. Uh, you know, making making a larger percentage of a much larger pie is better than you know, or a smaller percentage of a larger pie can be better than making a bigger percentage of a smaller pie. Uh, I don't know much about it. We find everything done through drive has been very convenient for us to point there. Um, it's not to say I'm not open for changes, but, you know, having used drive you know, with the previous company as well, back when drive was first started, Guardians Board is one of the first companies to jump on there. Uh, okay. So I've had a long history working with them. I don't see a reason to change it, but, uh, you know, at some point uh, we weren't with Japan Anime Games and now we are. So uh, there's always room for growth. Okay. If I didn't ask the question, my fans would have, or fans, uh, our viewers would have, uh, would have beat me up. They would have come to my house and beat me up. So the question yeah. has been asked. You got the answer. <laughs> I honestly have never heard of this other company before. So it's, 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 like it's brand, brand new. new to me. So um, yeah. yeah, I don't know anything about it. 
uh, and of course I just uh, put on Bessemon here. So you can see PDFs there. Of course, I, I, I know there are people who disagree with this, but those people are bad. Um, I know some people think that PDFs are preferable to books. Never. You can search. I've got fingers. I've got an index. Uh, anyway, but uh, you can get your PDFs here and don't print them out on Lulu because Lulu's never mind. Um, and is that it? This says RPG Digest. Okay, that's my stuff. So, okay, that is it. I think we go back to the Kickstarter here. We finish up with looking at the Kickstarter one more time. Let's just see if anybody did back anything here. Like I said, I've been promoting it for a few days. So I think the people who are going to back may have already done it, but there's my F, not F11. I want F5. There's my F5. And doesn't look like it bumped up. It did. Yeah, yeah. it went up. Oh, yeah, it went oh, up. Okay. Low 46, high 46 to now the low 47. Oh, okay. And, well, and you are going to take credit for all of that, even though it could have likely been a coincidence. That's, yes, that's it was how all me. <laughs> that's, how, that's how this works. We take credit for everything during our segment. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, so let's 100%. scroll down one more time so everybody can be regaled with the awesomeness. That is the Bessem Multiverse 4th Edition. Again, you can find the, was it the one page write-up of these, uh, these multiverse worlds in the Bessem book. But this expands, you said 240 pages, about how many pages for each one? I know you gave a word count, but about how yeah. many pages for each one? Pages, uh, 12 to 15,000 yeah, 15, words. 15, 15 to 20 pages per, per okay. world. So the, the, there's main six worlds, and the book is uh, 224 pages. So if you're sitting roughly 30 pages each and then some extra stuff, that, that's about okay. where we're sitting. What's the artwork like in there? Uh, is it is it comparable to Bessem? Is it a little bit more, a little bit less? Yeah, so uh, certainly it it's comparable. Some of it is uh, a lot of it's new art. Some of it is is uh, like for example the character that you see right now there on you know on the the screen. So she was someone that we commissioned specifically for the Bessem multiverse cover, but we use her in the Bessem core book as well. So some of the art is used elsewhere, but uh, it's 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 good art. It's it's very mm -hmm. evocative of the different styles that we're looking at. And we try to have a, a range, just like there is a range of anime uh, depictions. We try to have a range of art styles as well. Awesome. So as we scroll down here, you can see the story. We are not going to read all this. We're going to kind of focus on is we're going to focus on some of the support over here. Um, I like how it's oh that's because I'm not in <laughs> I'm not in my account. Uh, where are we at? To, so you can pledge one dollar. This is a common trope for uh, Kickstarters. Hey, you know what? Want to support? Want to uh, let them have a coffee while he's working? Does this even would that be even buy a coffee anymore? No. One dollar on special days. On special days, there we go. If you want to buy half a cup of coffee for yeah. him, special <laughs> days when you're working from home, that's yeah. when a, that's when a dollar <laughs> buy a coffee. Two dollars, uh, two dollars more if you're a retailer. I, I, I'm confused by that one. So the retail is just to kind of indicate as a store, I'm interested. A lot of Kickstarters, mm. they require the retailer to buy in and actually buy a pledge at 50% discount. So, you know, oh, so, you know, here's a $300 retailer pledge and you get this at 50% off. But the problem is it ties up retailer money for potentially months. So what we want to do is we just want to give an opportunity for retailers to flag us to say, hey, contact me in the future to get a wholesale discount, but I don't tie up my dollars right away. So it's a kind of a courtesy that we sure. do for our retailers. That's pretty cool. I like that. And then we go down to the first big pledge of $25. I'm going to try to scroll on both sides just so people aren't bored with the same thing on the screen all the time here. We got the hopper for backers. Oh, I, can turn, oh, I can't read it there. That's why. Uh, for backers who plan to hop around the anime multiverse and only need a digital reward for you weirdos who only do PDFs. I don't understand any of you people, but I guess you're kind of popular. So there you go. You'll well, receive. that and also shipping costs are a killer, especially in oh. international. We and we we know that that's the case, and some people to avoid the shipping costs uh, will get PDFs as well. So um, we understand that that some people like PDFs and actually prefer it, but also the shipping is uh, especially if you're not U.S. and Canada. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I can't argue we, with you on that one. <laughs> no, no, we we actually ship something. What was it, Scotland? Yes. Mm. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and it, it would have been cheaper. To give him a PDF, give him the money to, yep. to have it print on demand and have it sent to his house, yep. then he had the, and the he money had to he pick had to it up pay to it up from customs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's difficult. He had to spend 50 bucks to pick it up from customs. 
Yeah. And that's the advantage that you have with, with RPGs versus board games. There is no equivalent of a PDF or a board game. Print, a, print and play don't work. Uh, not, not really. And so that's why we like the fact that we can have sales internationally all across the world. People can still get our products, not always in print, uh, but the fact that they can get them for half the price of a print book is uh, with no shipping costs is nice. I, 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 the tr used to be real simple. Just, you know, I'd get a, a, a PDF of a book, especially if it was already out of print. Cause I like to have some out of print games. I remember growing up with and used to go get them printed out. Now I can't do that anymore because the one place I used to use says we don't do that. Even though everybody still does that. I get my account terminated. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a, but you can get the PDF here. And, and absolutely. I, I agree with this. Like when we did our contest, unfortunately, even with all this right here, I was only shipping to CONUS, not even Alaska and Hawaii, CONUS, U.S. locations and APO, FPO. Isn't that funny that I can ship overseas to APO, FPO, but I can't ship to actual two states in our union because of these crazy shipping costs right now? So fully understand that. And if we go down $26 for one whole dollar more, you want a print copy of the Isika anime lit RPG novel hardcover. Oh, that's coming in hardcover. I didn't even notice that. Book one in a trilogy. So how are you going to do the, the other two books in the trilogy? Are those just going to be printed? Uh, are you, we just get them from Discami or are they going to be also so kickstarted the, or? Uh, I, I mean, at some point, this this is not going to be the, the last Besom Kickstarter. What, what I anticipate is given the timelines that we have set up throughout 2023, by the time we do the next Besom Kickstarter, I would guess both of volume two and three of the novel will both be done. And so we'll, we may release them at the same time rather than doing a Kickstarter for novel two only. Um, the, we still formulating plans on that but yeah we, we might end up holding them both and doing them at the same time yep. okay and i will do a book report on that first one since i'll be getting it. <laughs> i'll see if awesome. i can remember how was it was it five paragraphs is that what you had to do as a kid so i think that's what it was <laughs> all right um for 49 dollars. that's right not quite 50 it's like gas in the united states it's 3.99 the, the reason why we do this a lot is, you know, we saw one at 25, one at 26, one at 49, one at 50. This is so I can quickly look at the number and know what where they are in the pledges. Sure. Having two pledges at 50 and I see a $50 pledge, I don't know what it's for. Uh, or I see one at 49, I know instantly that it's different than the $50 pledge. So that's why we play with those dollars. It gives us, a, a you know, an organizational advantage. Okay. That, that makes sense. I, I, I'm using a little psychology there. Uh, for backers who are looking, I want to hover over it, but I can't. Okay, for backers who are looking to sample the setting, I cannot read. To sample the setting, world expansions, the anime multiverse, and only need digital rewards. So what are you going to get? You are going to receive PDF copies of Besom Multiverse. And Besom, how do I pronounce that? Is it Eurasia? Eurasia. Eurasia. Grave of Heaven. Grave of Heaven, that does not sound happy. No. So the, the setting of the world is that uh, heaven fell uh, a while ago and there was a big giant cataclysm. And this is kind of a post post apocalyptic fantasy world. So it's not as if it's just recently happened that happened a while ago. But yeah, heaven fell. The gods had a big fight and died and uh, destroyed most of the planet. And what's left is are these uh, islands in Eurasia uh, in a central area. And that's where Eurasia comes from. So it is so a, a single world. Uh, and it's an entire book, 224 pages on one world, one fantasy wow. world. So if I like post-apocalyptic, it's post-post-apocalyptic. Does that mean I'm going to like it twice as much? <laughs> just... Post-apocalyptic settings are, are actually my favorite setting to run in. Okay, I'm getting like about 30 comments on this, so I'm going to put it up here. What does Discami mean? And I know I'm pronouncing it because you actually said before the emphasis is supposed to be on the disc, but I can't do it. Yeah, Discami. So... Um... In short, Discomi is made up from two components. One is the, the Greek suffix dis, D-Y-S. Think of it as kind of means uh, non-functional or bad. Um, so, it, you know, someone has... Uh, you know, Anyway, there's lots of different words that start with DYS. Mm -hmm. And so it, it basically means, uh, you know, not healthy, not good, non-functional. Discontinuity, the part, disruption... Yeah. Well, those are DISs versus. I know, I know, but okay. it's it's been it's been English <laughs> Englishized. Yeah, it has, it has. Uh, and then the second part, kami, is the Japanese word for God, yes. uh, kami. And so diskami is non-functional god. god, or or bad bad god, or basically atheist, which is kind of the meaning behind diskami as the word. It was kind of a a non-functional god is the name of the company. Okay. There you go, chat. You have your answer.
All right, let's scroll down. Uh, we're at the $50. Yeah, I probably should scroll down here. You look at that awesome cover. Well, we talk about the $50 pledge, the expander for backers who want to adventure across the anime multiverse and prefer a physical copy of uh, the full color hardcover. Bonus, free digital copy included with your pledge, an extra 25 value. You receive both print and PDF copies of Bessem Multiverse. And with the multiverse cover in particular, when you look, those are kind of key character illustrations from the six different worlds. And they were designed to evoke different genres when you look at them. Mm -hmm. And that was was why it was set up. So obviously there's the demonic horror. There's, uh, you know, a psycho, uh, like a, a psychic future. There's the fantasy. There's your space opera. You got your high tech uh, kind of competitive world. And then your traditional fantasy uh, world as well. That's maybe a middle more, uh, you have your, your angel wings on there so okay. when this composition was done was to show you that it's multi-genre all right got the downloader and you'll receive pdf digital copies of best of multiverse Eurasia, ikarian gate iskai lit novel a digital and audiobook i don't uh, i've been starting to do audiobooks and i know on uh was it on wednesday or was it a different video that i watched where you talked about the audiobook version of uh of this, I think, mm -hmm. or Thursday. What would what, what, uh, the day? Yeah, that, that would have been on was... on on uh, Mildred's on uh, on Wednesday. So you say that? So the person who did the the voiceover, I don't know what you call it, the audiobook version. Yeah, the narrator, this, the, the reading, narrating uh, of this book. Uh, this isn't just some fly in the night. It's your brother just put a microphone in front. This is actually a professionally read. Oh yeah, there there are many professional audiobook narrators within the fantasy realm. In particular, lit RPGs has you know kind of their own popular ones that do a lot of in the lit RPG realm. And Jonathan Sleep, who does the narration for this, did a you know one of the the nine part one, which is Caverns and Creatures. Think of it as like your your D and D lit RPG. It's a very very funny series. The first one's Critical Failures, and uh, he's just a, a great narrator. And so we got him to do this as well. And he's you know the lit RPGs. There are other narrators that do those but they'll do other ones as well but certainly there are professional audiobook narrators and we wanted to make sure we went with a pro all right now we're getting into the big bucks we're at the three figures now folks three figures explorer for backers who want to explore the marvelous worlds okay let's just read what you get you receive both the print and pdf copies of bessem multiverse and bessem eurasia grave of heaven so that's both physical now, are these special hardcovers? Are these normal hardcovers, kind of like right. what I got with my best so these, these the leatherettes? So these, no, these are the regular books. The the uh, the deluxe limited editions that we did with the leather cover for both Bessem and uh, for Anime Five E, those were only for the core rules. But we have these ones have a few extra upgrades uh, that came out through Scratch Goals, so you got a little nice little bookmark mm -hmm. ribbon. We got some UV coating uh, on the front uh, cover characters, but they are standard hardcover. So there we go. I like hardcover books. I know a lot of people uh, in, in our circles, people have been turning more and more to softcover books saying they last longer. I don't know. I, I like hardcover books, so I'm happy with that. Now we're at 125. You'll receive both print and PDF copies of Bessem Multiverse, Bessem Eurasia, Grave of Heaven, and Bessem Multiverse Maps box set. Print only. I think that makes sense. Uh, now, can you talk to us about these maps? How big are they? What's uh, what's the benefit yes. of them? So they're they're uh, two by three feet, uh, approximately each one. You know, they, they'll be they're a metric size, but they're approximately two by three feet, uh, and they're going to come in a uh, a box set not dissimilar for the you know the, the Pixies Demonicity these types of boxes. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we're doing that is it's it's a convenient way to to shelve it on a retail store, but it also protects the maps. And so we have the six prime worlds. We are having a a full map design for each of the prime worlds, and while they're different genres, obviously maps are maps. I mean, whether something's a fantasy world or a high tech world the, the a mountain's going to look like a mountain uh, in many ways so you can actually use these maps in in anything if you don't even play Bessem and you want to use uh, this map as uh, you know a, a continent or uh, uh, even just a country in your D, D game or your rifts game or whatever you can do that and so we just thought if we're doing these maps anyway for the book because all of them are printed in the book itself okay. but they're printed with eight and a half by 11 size but they're they're so nice. Wouldn't it make sense to have a large version that people can pop out either on the table or keep put it on their wall or whatnot, which is why we have the the pack of six. 
And fans of Hyperborea will probably understand this because uh, one of the backing levels with Hyperborea was getting that big kind of hex map of the Hyperborea land. So I better not hear any crap in Discord about, ah, oh, the maps are dumb. No, you, you all bought maps from elsewhere. Now you can get maps here as well. I have a kind of a map fetish, so, you know, I'm probably... I probably need to go see a doctor about that. Pledge, $150. Crafty just said that he backed at $150. This is the level that I backed at as well. Let's see what, what am I going to get. You receive both print and PDF digital copies of Bessem Multiverse, Bessem Eurys of Grave of Heaven, Bessem Multiverse Maps. Yeah, that's actually why I backed this one, because I was like, I want bigger maps. And the Akarian Gate, Isekai, if I hope I said that right, my wife will come in here and punch me in the face if I didn't. Lit RPG novel. I don't need the audiobook. I actually want the physical thing in my hand. That's why I stopped here. But look at all the fun and glorious things you can get there. And we already just uh, talked about what the novel is. Uh, we talked about the mask, talked about Grave Heaven Multi. There we go. It's all physical products of things we talked about. Let me scroll down here. Well, here, let's show that cover for a minute. Before we go to the last one, this is the last one. Yeah. 175 big old dollars. I got to stop hovering over the things. Drive me crazy. You receive both the print and PDF copies of Best of Multiverse, Best of Muries and Grave of Heaven, Best of Multiverse Maps, <gasps> Ikarian Gate, Isakai Lit RPG Novel, and Ikarian Gate Lit RPG Novel Audiobook. Oh, and the digital files. I'm sorry. Oh, does this one not come with the physical book? No, it, it, it does. It's print okay. and PDF. The reason why we highlighted the digital files is because it's not just a PDF. You get a PDF, but then you also get uh, an, uh, uh, a the ebook format as well yeah. and so it's there's you actually get three versions of of the book you get an e an, an epub or uh, an ebook format as well as a pdf and an audiobook all right okay. let me hover over these uh last images here kickstarter and then we'll give you any final words you want to say thank you for spending two and a half hours with us that was awesome especially since we didn't talk about time beforehand probably should have been like hey you know our stream's oh, going a little pleasure. long here so uh, I, I will point out if you just scroll up a little bit yeah, uh, sure. back there, so you can actually download the first five chapters of Akarian Gate, and you can listen to a five minute audio sample, which of course takes place in the middle of the book. So it's not going to, you know, from a story wise, it's not going to make any sense, but it gives you uh, an idea of, of Jonathan Sleep's wow. narration. And the first five chapters uh, is a great way, and plus the uh, the prologue, uh, so it gives you an idea of where the the story is going. So wait, wait. If I download and read chapters one through five, and then I listen to the audiobook that comes in the middle of the book, how much of the story do I get? Very little. <laughs> All right. By design, yes. <laughs> right. It's it's a suck you in though. And then I wanted to scroll down and look at all those fun things here. There we go. Look at all the stretch goals unlocked. 15k, 20k. We got spot UV coding. We have adventure scenario. We have a landmark map sticker sheet. That reminds me of Forbidden Lands. All the way down here. Next one to get unlocked is a large map of Shadow River City. And I think I'm pretty sure he's going to hit that. And then we'll see more after that. Because like you said earlier, stretch goals are added as stretch goals are obtained. And look at our little mecca there. So I'm going to put this link. The link is in the description below already. I'm going to put this in the chat. I would like to see people back this. And I mean that sincerely because uh, Mark has been awesome to us, not just by being here today, but everything he's done in the past. Uh, as I mean, I've got the games there. You guys know I'm not an well, I can't right there. Uh, you guys know I'm not an anime guy, but uh, you know, I just felt like I, I should back because you know sometimes good people deserve to have good things happen. So there we go. Uh, get that off the screen. All right, any final comments that uh, that you want to throw on out here about how much you hated? I mean, I, how <laughs> how everything was today? Anything that we didn't ask? The floor is yours to talk about everything. We do have a couple of uh, starred questions. Uh, I think they might be for you, what we'll finish up with, but uh, I want to leave this time for you right now. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, this has been a, a great conversation hanging out and, and talking about stuff I'm passionate about and what you're passionate about. Uh, I just really wanted to express my thanks once again to all of your, your listeners and watchers and, and you both particularly for helping me out with that um, crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo. That made um, you know, a lot of difference. And in many ways, the, the impact of what you did was more valuable than the actual dollar value and that yeah. that meant a lot like, psychologically it's through. a it's, it's a boost especially when you're sick to to yeah. know that people are thinking about you that that, even, that was huge uh, don't know. yeah that's huge yeah so so good so thank you once again and i said the the fact that i can do this now uh you know is 
such an improvement. That's awesome. I'm not 100%, but I'm about 95% now. And uh, it has been- Are you great. able to so, sleep so through a you. night? How about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. My, my <laughs> nights are are wonderful now. I mean, uh, these, the fact is, is everything is back to normal with the except I don't have quite the same range. And sometimes there'll be a little bit of twinging of pain if I move my arm in a certain way. But uh, yeah, the fact that I can- have a normal life now uh, and use it uh, the way most people are supposed to use their arms, uh, which which is wonderful. So thank you, uh, everyone. And I want I want to second that to uh, the folks out there who donated. Thank you very much. Uh, when we did have that Friday night show stream to uh, we went through the video, we went the uh, you know we talked about it and people donated. I wasn't sure how that was going to go, but uh, you guys uh, stepped up and that was awesome. And that's a testament to you guys. And Mark, I just want to uh, tell you, and I mean this in all sincerity next Kickstarter you have, or if there's a, there's a product you want to talk about, heck, if you want to just come out and chill out with us, yeah, you're, you're welcome on any time. And uh, I have zero issues promoting anything that you're doing. So, uh, and I mean that it's up to you because I'm going to end the stream pretty abruptly here. I'm going to let Heathen Dog say some things here. If you want to hang out for like five minutes after the fact, if you don't have the time, no problem. Uh, yeah, I can shoot you an email later. It, it's up to you. But I think we're going to end this here in just a moment. Uh, Heathen Dog, can you wrap this up with your words of wisdom? And then uh, I'm not even going to play this. By the way, I'm not going to play the theme song today, folks. I'm wow. just going to end the stream. I know I'm not doing anything, right? I just I yeah. think this is a good place to end it. Okay. It will automatically jump you over if he's still streaming to Victor's uh, The Dutch Oven stream. Okay. So uh, if, if he's still streaming, it should pop you over to Victor Gorchev. Uh, and with that, again, one more time, Mark, thank you very much. I'm going to let Heathen Dog talk us out here. Heathen Dog, take it away. Okay. I want you to remember Bessem is a is a point-based system, which means, just, just as Mark said, the training wheels are going to come off. So if, if, you, if you've gotten the game today, if you've, got, if you've gotten the game and haven't opened it yet or hasn't been delivered to you yet, read the whole thing first. Ask questions of, of people in forums, stuff like that. Look at the templates. The, 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 the templates are not really there for you to just plug and play. Oh, I want to play a werewolf. I want to play a vampire. Here's everything I need. No, they're there to give you ideas for the kind of werewolf, or the kind of vampire that you want to make. Remember, because it's a point-based system, it is up to your imagination. And the whole multiversal... Uh, spider web type uh, cosmic web type uh, type theory is is different than what we've been talking about in plating where plating you can go from one place to another that it, it, with the only mode of travel is the best mode of travel and you can go anywhere at any time any place no sometimes if you're using the the listed mode of travel sometimes there's just a point where you can't get there from here you got to go somewhere else first to get to your destination you actually want to go to it's it's more of a highway system than than a jump through a portal walks and now there is there is you know you want to spend all the points you can get dimensional walk that's great but remember if you're using the book the way it's written which we we always advocate you you have to you have to have your players understand the whole cosmic web system if you're using the multiversal system you have to have them understand how it works and then everyone's going to get along the whole thing's going to go very smoothly after these few caveats and addendums are ironed out between you and your player characters it's going to be a fun ride you're going to like it whether you like anime or not you're going to like the system the ease of use the the utility of use and the smoothness of gameplay and after all of that, I'm a liar because I forgot to go through the four questions. <laughs> uh, no, we already talked about that. Three questions. Um, I have a question. Has Mark considered doing bits and mortar? I don't, don't know what, what that, that is. is. Yeah, okay, so no. All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, you dislike this, but there is a D20 Bessem out yeah, there. It's garbage. On drive through. it's sold by White Wolf. Is this, is this a game that is out of print now? Yeah, so this this came out uh, in the early 2000s, uh, yeah. and it was our kind of decision to take Bessem and bring it into the D20 system, which at the time was very popular, and there was reasons to switch over. As one of my friends said, uh, if you don't do anime in the D20 game, someone else is going to, and you are the anime role-playing guy, so you need to do it now. I was like, oh, that's a good point. Actually, I probably should do it. Uh, I don't think I did a very good job. No, no, the, the better advice is if you're the anime guy, you should do it best. 
Yeah, and and I and I didn't. I took the I took the approach of Bessem is better than D and D, and therefore I'm going to show how everyone uh, how clever I am and how good my game is and how stupid D and D is. And that was kind of the approach I took when designing the game. And I think it shows. Now it's a very popular game. Some people still love it and still play it now. But I think that it it didn't come from the right heart and the right uh, reason to create it. And so I think it was not good good this game design back then anime 5e is you could say it's a spiritual successor to best 20 but it was taken from the right place and i think it's a vastly improved game compared to best 20 but as a pdf white wolf owns best 20 and so they still sell it but it's uh, it's again it's been on print for quite a while right okay all right then the last one and no i'm not taking any more questions <laughs> So quick question, is the new Bessem the same as the old 90s Bessem or totally different? I can tell you that the Bessem 4 book actually talks about each of the different yeah. uh, editions. But uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so it's an evolution of TriStat. So it's not TriStat from 1997, but it's still three stats. There's still attributes. There's still defects. It's still a point-based system. But what we and, and you still have your attack and defense combat values. But what we've done is we've improved the presentation and increased the op the options that you have. So the customization that we we've given a lot more options previously it was a lot more hand waving and we've added more and more rules that are optional rules and rules that you can have to expand the options for character creation but none of them are necessary so it's the same bones and it's the same framework but it's it's not the exact same game compatible sure it's compatible but it's uh, it's a slight change better balanced more comprehensive uh, a lot more options and better supported uh, than it was back then but it's still the tristats. And in fact, Bessem, when it first came out, as I mentioned, it wasn't even called tristat. It didn't exist as a system that came later. Uh, but it is the ev evolution of it. I would call it maybe tristat 4.0. If you consider first edition tristat was first edition Bessem, then second edition Bessem, then Silver Age Sentinels uh, tristat, then maybe even tristat DX. Yeah, so actually, this is probably five. Sex section five or 5.5 5 uh, for the TriStat system evolution. But I don't ant anticipate there's going to be a six version of TriStat. It's done, it's complete, and, and it's right the way it is. Awesome. And I'll end the show on a $10 super chat. Thank you very much for <laughs> from Kevin Sullivan here. Thank you for the super chat. He's sending that to me for postage. Um, it's going to cost more than that, but that's okay. I did this out of Legion Myth funds. It's a right, it's a write off. I took it out of his funds. So all the hacks that he wanted to give me today, well, he's getting not getting <laughs> yeah, paid. So I, you all have a great day. It.